Hello guys, uh, so now we shall be discussing one of the very important topic that is the oculomotor nerve. Okay, so a topic of discussion would be regarding the oculomotor nerve. So we shall discuss as many important points as possible uh, in this uh, short session of neuroanatomy as well as head and neck. Okay, so coming to this oculomotor nerve, what are the important things which you need to know? First of all, let us uh, look at these structures which are present over here. Let us label these and then we shall discuss about the nerve. So here, uh, this particular structure which is on the back over here is called as superior colliculus. See, this particular structure over here is called as your superior colliculus. You know, we have got one superior colliculus, one inferior colliculus. Superior colliculus is responsible for the vision, whereas inferior colliculus is responsible for the hearing, right? Now, what is this particular structure which I have uh, written over, drawn over here? This is called as periaqueductal gray matter, okay? So, you see a aqueduct there. Surrounding that aqueduct, there is a piece of gray matter and that is called as your periaqueductal gray matter. This is called peri aqueductal gray matter peri aqueductal gray matter okay now on either sides of the peri aqueductal gray matter you have got a pink color nucleus there right so that pink color nucleus is nothing but called as your oculomotor nerve nucleus okay so this is your oculomotor nucleus this is your oculomotor nucleus okay now from this oculomotor nucleus you see a branch that is running down this branch is called as oculomotor nerve okay this is nucleus and this branch is called as this blue color branch is called as oculomotor nerve so this oculomotor nerve what will happen is that first of all this oculomotor nerve which is locate where is this oculomotor nerve coming from it is coming from the ventral side of the periaqueductal gray matter exactly speaking where is, where is this oculomotor nerve nucleus present? The nucleus is present ventral to periaqueductal gray matter. Okay. Now, the fibers, once they are coming out of this oculomotor nerve nucleus, these fibers, they cross the red nucleus. You see, which I have drawn in the red is called nucleus rubar or also called as your red nucleus. And by the way, tell me which tract starts from this red nucleus here. You know, that is rubrospinal tract right so these fibers are crossing this red nucleus and these fibers are also crossing a black color substance called substantia nigra now you tell me is it crossing the medial side see here if this is your substantia nigra like this now are the fibers crossing from the medial side of substantia nigra or from the lateral side of substantia nigra they are crossing from the medial aspect of substantia nigra okay so this is what I have written over here. You can see that this oculomotor nerve is oculomotor nucleus. This is nucleus, okay, where it is located ventral to the periaqueductal gray matter. Second important thing is that this nucleus will have fibers that, that is oculomotor nerve. They cross first the red nucleus, then the medial part of substantia nigra, okay. Right, so once they are crossing, what is happening with them? What is happening with them is that they come all the way and you see an artery over here what is this artery this particular artery over here is called as basilar artery basilar artery i hope all of you know that uh, your uh, the blood supply of the brain is mainly supplied by two systems one is called as the internal carotid systems and vertebro basilar system so this is the basilar artery now this basilar artery is dividing into two more branches here one is called the top one is called as posterior cerebral artery and the lower one is called as superior cerebellar artery not cerebral cerebellar artery okay so here you have got the posterior cerebral artery and the lower one is called as superior right this is called as superior cerebellar artery superior cerebellar artery so it comes like this it first gives superior cerebellar artery then goes and then it divides into posterior cerebral artery now this oculomotor nerve what it is doing it is passing below this oculomotor nerve is passing below the posterior cerebral artery and above the superior cerebellar artery see this is posterior cerebral artery this is superior cerebellar artery this nerve is passing below this artery and above another artery in this way okay this is passing in this way now as this comes all the way down it is going to enter into a sinus and this sinus is called as cavernous sinus 
actually it moves on to the lateral wall of cavernous sinus and then it enters into your eyeball okay so this now, now forget about this green color now okay we will discuss about it later on this blue color nerve is crossing a fissure right so which is located on the back of the eye this is called as the supra orbital fissure on the back of the orbit you have got supra orbital fissure right or superior orbital fissure now once it crosses this superior orbital fissure now what is happening this oculomotor nerve divides into two branches one going on the top one going on the down which is going on the top is called superior division and the lower one is called as inferior division so i am writing it as uh, here i am writing it as a i am writing it as b now what is a a is going on to the top that is your superior division b is your inferior division okay so a is your superior division while as b is your inferior division inferior division okay superior division as well as inferior division now let us say what is this superior division doing this superior division is supplying two muscles one is i have written it already here that is muscle number 1 and 2 so what is this muscle number 1 one is called as c which is supplying your eyelid the upper eyelid upper eyelid so once this muscle will contract your upper eyelid is raised so that is why called as levator palpebra superioris palpebra is your eyelid superioris is on the top levator is levation and next it supplies another muscle that is attached to the eyeball the muscle which is attached on the top of the eyeball what is that guys see if you are looking from the anterior side right if this is your eyeball like this okay so if you come across the muscle see this muscle is called superior rectus this muscle is called as inferior rectus okay and let us say this is the nose and this muscle over here is called as medial rectus this is called as lateral rectus and here we have got superior oblique and here we have got as inferior oblique so what are the muscles over here one is superior rectus inferior rectus medial rectus lateral rectus superior oblique and inferior oblique right and by the way i'll be going a little bit faster in these sessions because these are the rapid revision sessions of individual um, segment in anatomy okay so now we shall be discussing all these things but little bit fastly but most of the topics will be covered okay so superior inferior middle so from the side if you are saying right which muscle is this which is number two this might be your superior rectus now next important thing i will write about uh, these things later on now look at the inferior division inferior division is giving three branches okay see one branch is supplying to muscle number three right that see where is your muscle number three see this one is your muscle number three okay that is your medial rectus and after that down to the eyeball and other muscle is attached that will be called as your inferior rectus and this one muscle number four this is called as your inferior oblique muscle so it is supplying to three muscles one is uh, three uh, 4 and here let me write it as 5 okay so let us say this is 5 so 3 is your medial rectus 4 is your inferior oblique and 5 is your inferior rectus so let us write it down now that we have discussed about the superior and the inferior division right so superior division superior division and inferior division now coming to the superior division this superior division is going to innervate how many muscles it is going to innervate two of them so out of which one muscle name i told you levator palpebra levator palpebra superioris okay and the second muscle is superior rectus second muscle is superior rectus in the same way after the superior division next we have got the inferior division next we have got the inferior division now this inferior division supplies again to three important muscles like this so what are these three important muscles here where the inferior division is supplying it supplies to that's what i told you medial rectus medial rectus and next inferior oblique inferior oblique medial rectus and in what is this after that we have got uh, inferior uh, rectus muscle medial rectus inferior rectus and inferior oblique right inferior rectus 
inferior rectus so these are the muscles to which it is supplying so this would be a one and two right so let me mention the others also so this is three four and five right so this is three four and five right so this is what i was telling you and next important thing you need to understand here what is this another important thing is that if you see here right uh, there is a nucleus right so there is a nucleus that is located adjacent to this periaqueductal gray matter what is the name of the nucleus this is edinger westphal nucleus so from this edinger westphal nucleus only you have got the parasympathetic fibers that are coming out and how are these parasympathetic fibers traveling these parasympathetic fibers are traveling parallel to this oculomotor nerve okay so these fibers also they travel parallel to this oculomotor nerve they also enter into this cavernous sinus let me write it down that this particular uh, nucleus over here is what is this this is by the name edinger westphal nucleus edinger westphal nucleus now this travels all the way and this parasympathetic fiber this green color fiber is nothing but your parasympathetic fiber parasympathetic fiber right so this parasympathetic fiber goes along the superior division or it travels along the inferior division it travels along b inferior division exactly speaking it is traveling within the inferior division also it is traveling along the nerve that is supplying to the inferior oblique or the other muscles obviously it is traveling along the nerve which is supplying to inferior oblique and now it is going in, it is it is going to enter into a specific ganglion over here you see a specific ganglion which is which i've drawn over here right you see this ganglion this particular ganglion which i've drawn over here is called as ciliary ganglion so these fibers are going and they are relaying on the ciliary ganglion so before the ganglion whatever fibers are there they are called pre or post they are called as pre okay so it means so far whatever green color nerve i have described right now this is parasympathetic fiber but preganglionic or postganglionic it is present before the ganglion so preganglionic preganglionic parasympathetic fibers after the ciliary ganglion these fibers which are coming here they are called as postganglionic fibers now these postganglionic fibers they give off short ciliary nerves so these are multiple short ciliary nerves you know short ciliary nerves what do they do they supply to two important muscles what are those two important muscles to which they supply see here they supply to two important muscles here in the eyeball so one muscle is by the name ciliary muscle all of you know what is ciliary muscle right and second important muscle will constrict the pupil that is called as constrictor pupillae muscle that is called as constrictor pupillae muscle okay so two important muscles these short ciliary nerves are going to supply the postganglionic fibers the postganglionic fibers which ganglion ciliary ganglion right so let me write down the name of this particular ganglion that is your ciliary ganglion ciliary ganglion okay so the postganglionic fibers they supply what ciliary muscle as well as constrictor pupillae muscle okay we shall discuss what kind of cranial nerve is this whether it is sensory or motor which is a very basic thing and also we shall discuss individually the functions of each and every cranial nerve okay so which are most commonly asked in the exams so this would be a quick review now again i'm telling you don't expect any kind of uh, basics here so regarding the cranial nerves very detailedly separately i have taught right but uh, this is just a uh, quick review so coming to the olfactory nerve and uh, by the way you know the mnemonic right so how to remember all these things and all you know whether it is sensory or whether it is motor so very easy way that is some say money matters some say money matters but but my brother says big books matter more says big books matter more so some says money matters but my brother says big books matter more so some says money matters big but my brother says big books matter more so this is how you remember whether it is sensory or whether it is motor now when it comes to some s stands for what s stands for sensory so this is a sensory nerve olfactory nerve is a sensory nerve when it comes to optic again the optic is also a sensory nerve coming to oculomotor m stands for what m stands for motor nerve 
right next what is your trochlear trochlear is also a motor nerve okay after that we have got trigeminal trigeminal is b b stands for both both in the sense mixed nerve both sensory as well as motor okay again m here stands for motor nerve again b here stands for mixed nerve which means again both sensory as well as the mixed okay next vestibular cochlear nerve is again sensory nerve sensory nerve and b here stands for both that is the glossopharyngeal nerve is a mixed nerve is a mixed nerve coming to the vagus nerve vagus nerve is also a mixed nerve right and finally the later two are motor 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 as well as the motor nerves now if we discuss one by one if we discuss one by one let us see what is the use of olfactory um, nucleus uh, sir, uh, sorry the olfactory cranial nerve there is only one function of olfactory cranial nerve that is smell that is smell coming to the optic nerve so what are the functions there are basically two functions what are those two functions one is your vision one is the vision and what is the second one second one is that is pupillary light reflex what kind of pupillary light reflex efferent pupillary light reflex repeat what kind of pupillary uh, light reflex that is a efferent limb of pupillary light reflex so what do i mean by that is that for example the moment the light rays fall on the retina the information is taken back to the cortex this is called efferent now from the cortex if the information is coming back to the eye this is called as efferent so this is efferent this is efferent it maintains the efferent limb of pupillary light reflex pupillary light reflex light reflex so these two cranial nerves are pretty simple now the difficult one is this one right obviously there are many more things so oculomotor nerve so what did we discuss uh, previously regarding this oculomotor nerve guys oculomotor nerve is oculo motor oculo is eye motor is, is it is supplying the muscles of the eye so within this oculomotor nerve we divide this into two okay so one is somatic so there are somatic functions at the same time there is also parasympathetic function somatic as well as parasympathetic now what are the somatic functions here yes what can be the somatic functions over here there are two somatic functions one there should be eyelid opening another one is eye movement okay so it will control the muscles of the eye so what do you mean by eyelid opening for example i am closing my eyelids now if you are contracting this muscle which is located here this is called as levator palpebra superioris when you are contracting is my eyelid is opening like this right so eyelid opening is one another one is eye movement eye movement in the sense i look up down medially laterally right so this is called as eye movement so th those movements are your somatic movements okay so those are your somatic movements when it comes to parasympathetic what is parasympathetic parasympathetic is you constrict the pupils or accommodation right so these are the two parasympathetic actions you know it from your physiology so somatic actions are something like movement actions like motor actions one is eyelid opening action eyelid opening action another one is eye movement action eye movement eyelid opening and eye movement what do you in eyelid opening what is the muscle here how does the eyelid open that is superior palpebral muscle or also called as levator palpebra superioris levator palpebra palpebra superioris muscle levator palpebra superioris muscle is responsible for eyelid opening now when it comes to eyelid movement what are the muscles to which it is supplying i told you one is called as superior rectus okay another one is called as inferior rectus next we have got is the medial rectus next we have got is the lateral oh, sorry next we have got is a medial rectus and next inferior oblique inferior oblique superior rectus inferior rectus medial rectus and inferior oblique you told me superior oblique also you told me lateral rectus also then where are those see very important thing to remember here is that you have to remember a mnemonic that is lr6 so4 r3 
what do you mean by lr6 so4 r3 lr6 in the sense lateral rectus lateral rectus is supplied by sixth pair of cranial nerve which is your abducent nerve okay what is so4 so4 stands for superior oblique superior oblique is supplied by fourth pair of cranial nerve which is your trochlear nerve next now we will be talking about that only next r3 r3 in the sense the rest are the leaving these two the remaining all are supplied by this one the third pair that is your oculomotor nerve okay the third pair of cranial nerve that is oculomotor nerve so superior rectus inferior rectus medial and inferior oblique okay inferior oblique inferior oblique when it comes to parasympathetic i just now told you parasympathetic actions are only two what are those two parasympathetic actions one is pupillary constriction pupillary constriction obviously when parasympathetic system in the sense what whenever you are resting and relaxing that time the system that uh, activates is parasympathetic system in when you are resting do are your eyelids open like this no when you are resting slowly your pupils will constrict and you will go to sleep right so pupillary constriction so how does this pupillary constriction happening it is because of the third pair of cranial nerve which will activate a muscle called as pupillary sphincter it will contract the pupillary sphincter muscle pupillary sphincter it will contract that pupillary sphincter muscle next action is what accommodation next action is what accommodation okay accommodation of your light so accommodation is done by which one that is your ciliary muscle that is done by your ciliary muscle so two important actions one is called as pupillary constriction and the other one is called as accommodation okay so these are the two important things coming to that uh, coming to the next one that is trochlear nerve trochlear nerve has got only one function that is eye movement and i already told you trochlear nerve is a motor nerve and that is superior oblique that's what i told you so4 superior oblique is supplied by the fourth pair of cranial nerve now the major nerve that is your trigeminal nerve trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve i told you trigeminal nerve is a fifth pair of cranial nerve which is a mixed nerve mixed nerve in the sense what it has got both the sensory uh, nerves as well as both the motor innervation also so what are the sensory functions so how do you remember there are actually many sensory functions very easy to remember is that many tigers remember it like this many tigers jump making and silly many tigers jump making ants silly so this trigeminal nerve as i told you the sensory and the motor branches so this is the best mnemonic to remember that is many tigers jump making ants silly okay now if you see here what does m stands for what what is this m standing for m stands for mucous membranes mucous membranes in the sense so this takes the sensations from the oral cavity as well as the nasal cavity mucous membranes which means it takes the sensations from both oral and nasal cavity oral cavity and nasal cavity okay oral cavity as well as the nasal cavity okay these are the two things second important thing what is the second important thing the second important thing is the teeth so tiger here stands for the teeth okay now coming to the third important thing what is this third important thing that is j what is j j is a joint what is that joint temporomandibular joint i hope all of you know that here you have your temporomandibular joint right so j stands for temporo mandibular joint okay temporomandibular joint now coming to the fourth important thing making right so making what does making stand for meninges so even from the meninges also the sensations are taken so meninges and the fifth important thing is making ants what does ants ant stand for anterior wall of external auditory canal so from the anterior wall of the external auditory canal also the sensations are taken up anterior wall of external auditory canal okay anterior wall of external auditory canal 
and the last important one is makes uh, making ants silly what does silly stands for somato sensation so somato sensation from the anterior two third of the tongue somato sensation from anterior two third of the tongue from anterior two third of the tongue somato sensation from the anterior two third of the tongue so these are the six important things okay what are those six important things one is your mucous membranes uh, i mean they are taking sensations from the oral cavity and the nasal cavity teeth temporomandibular joint meninges anterior wall of the external auditory canal and somato sensation from the anterior two third of the tongue okay now these are the sensations now coming to the motor so mainly and mainly it use innervation to muscles of mastication all of you know there are different kinds of muscles of mastication okay so it gives innervation to the muscles of mastication now when it comes to the muscles of mastication what are the different kinds of muscles of mastication you have got so the first important thing is you have got tell me what are the different kinds of muscles of mastication one is masseter another one is temporalis muscle one is medial pterygoid another one is your lateral pterygoid okay so masseter second one is your temporalis third one is your medial pterygoid and fourth one is your lateral pterygoid so all to your muscles of mastication you have got you have got what you have got this motor supply now another important thing you need to understand over here apart from muscles of mastication also to other muscles also it gives innervation but before we discuss that now what is the one action which you need to know here for example if you contract this medial pterygoid what is the function that is happening action that is happening medial pterygoid will close the jaw then lateral pterygoid the opposite muscle it will open the jaw okay so medial pterygoid will close the jaw whereas the lateral pterygoid will open the jaw open the jaw and there is also another reflex called as jaw reflex right that is called as jaw jerk reflex so which muscle is responsible for jaw jerk reflex that is your masseter muscle so this is responsible for jaw jerk reflex and very very important thing okay now apart from these muscles of mastication is there any other muscle it gives motor supply yes so that muscles are called as mat muscles what are mat muscles m stands for mylohyoid you know here we have got mylohyoid muscle we have got mylohyoid muscle apart from mylohyoid we have got anterior belly of digastric muscle anterior belly of diagastric muscle okay now third and fourth important thing what are these two muscles one is called as tensor tympani muscle what does this tensor tympani do whenever there are loud sounds so from loud sounds this tensor tympani muscle basically protects right the eardrum another one is tensor veli palatinum so tensor tympani tensor tympani muscle and the other one is tensor veli palatinum okay so these are the muscles so m a t t you see here m a t and t okay so these are the muscles which it is going to give an innervation so these are the muscles of mastication and these are the muscles to which it gives the motor supply okay so this is all about your trigeminal nerve now after this trigeminal nerve the next important nerve which you come across is the sixth pair of cranial nerve that is your abducens nerve that is your abducens nerve okay so again i'm telling you for abducens nerve how do you remember it you remember it by the mnemonic so4 lr6 r3 so4 lr6 r3 so4 stands for superior oblique is innervated by fourth pair lr6 is lateral rectus by sixth pair it means this abducens nerve supplies to which muscle that is your lateral rectus muscle so your abducens nerve by the way it is sensory or motor it is motor okay and it gives innervation to which muscle that is your lateral rectus right coming to another important nerve that is called as your facial nerve okay another important nerve is called as your facial nerve 
Now facial nerve is both sensory as well as motor. It has got sensory branches and it is also got motor branches. So let us see what are the sensory innervations as well as the motor uh, supply, motor innervations. Okay. Coming to the sensory innervation, this facial <coughs> coming to the sensory innervation, this facial nerve, right? It takes the taste sensation from the anterior two third of the tongue. So there is a branch of facial nerve called as corda tympani which takes the sensations from the anterior two third of the tongue. So here it takes the taste sensation from anterior two third of the tongue. It takes the taste sensation from the anterior two third of the tongue via a branch called as corda tympani. Corda tympani. Okay. Now, when it comes to the motor innervation, so within this motor innervation, again, there are two important types. What are those two important types? One is somatic, another one is parasympathetic. So, what are the somatic here? Somatic in the sense, okay, tell me what are somatic and parasympathetic. Somatic in the sense, it innervates the muscles of facial expression, like eyelid closing, let us say jaw opening, hyoid elevation. So, all these motor actions which are happening within the face are somatic. Right now, when it comes to parasympathetic, what parasympathetic actions can be in the face? Let us say lacrimation, lacrimation reflex, let us say salivation, all these are the parasympathetic actions. So, they are carried out by the motor fibers. Okay, so how do you remember these? Remember by the mnemonic F E J H. Okay, F E J H. F stands for the muscles of facial expression, F stands for it supplies the muscles of facial expression muscles of facial expression next it also is responsible for eyelid closing not eyelid opening it is eyelid closing for eyelid opening it is levator palpebra superioris which we discussed and here it is eyelid closing which is orbicularis oculi orbicularis oculi okay and next important thing this will also help in jaw opening this will also help in jaw opening okay and how does it help in jaw opening which muscle will it contract it will contract the diagastric muscle now when it comes to diagastric it is anterior belly or posterior belly it contracts the posterior belly of diagastric muscle posterior belly of diagastric muscle and the next important action is a hyoid elevation hyoid elevation you know beneath the hyoid we have got the thyroid right so it is responsible for the elevation of the hyoid okay by a muscle called as stylohyoid muscle stylohyoid muscle okay next apart from this there are two important reflexes so what are these two important reflexes one is corneal reflex another one is acoustic reflex so one is corneal uh, reflex another one is acoustic reflex acoustic reflex so acoustic reflex is happening because of the contraction of which muscle stapedius muscle stapedius muscle so the mnemonic goes here like this that is f e j h okay so these are what what are these actions which i have just now explained you these are your somatic actions all these are your somatic actions Apart from somatic, we have got another action that that's what I told you previously that is parasympathetic action. Apart from this, we have also got parasympathetic action. Now, parasympathetic action in the sense there are three important parasympathetic actions. What are those three important actions? One is salivation, lacrimation, lacrimation reflex. One is salivation. Another one is lacrimation. And the third one is lacrimation reflex. Lacrimation reflex. Lacrimation reflex. Okay. So these are uh, in connection with the facial nerve. Now, when it comes to the eighth pair of cranial nerve, what is your eighth pair of cranial nerve over here? That is your vestibulocochlear nerve. What is that? Vestibulocochlear nerve. Now, when it comes to vestibular cochlear nerve, you need to important, uh, you need to uh, uh, remember this that it has got two important components. So, one is called as a vestibular component, another one is called as a cochlear component. 
now what is the use of this vestibular component vestibular component is responsible for the balance whereas the cochlear component is responsible for hearing so within the vestibular cochlear now there are two important actions that are happening what are those two important actions one is called as balance one is called as balance another one is called as hearing okay another one is called as hearing when it comes to balance balance is done by vestibular nerve hearing is done by cochlear nerve hearing is done by cochlear nerve okay right apart from this coming to the next important thing that is your ninth pair of cranial nerve what is your ninth pair of cranial nerve ninth pair of cranial nerve is called as your glossopharyngeal nerve glossopharyngeal nerve that is your ninth pair of cranial nerve coming to the glossopharyngeal nerve now within the glossopharyngeal nerve you have mainly got what you have mainly got the sensory component right so what is the sensory component in case of glossopharyngeal nerve what is the sensory component in case of uh, glossopharyngeal nerve you need to remember by the mnemonic v a s t e okay so this is the easy mnemonic to remember so what does v stands for is that v stands for visceral sensations visceral sensations in the sense you know we have got carotid sinus okay and another important thing called as carotid body so this takes the sensations both from the carotid sinus and carotid body what is the use of carotid sinus carotid sinus is responsible to maintain the blood pressure why because we have got baroreceptors there and what is the use of carotid body carotid body is is, is also called as a chemo sensation why because it 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 exactly um, it exactly uh, calculates the level of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide which is present so two important things one is carotid sinus another one is carotid body okay so the first important thing is visceral sensation visceral sensation so visceral sensation is taken up by this carotid sinus carotid sinus okay so carotid sinus in the sense what kind of receptors baroreceptors baroreceptors for blood pressure baroreceptors for blood pressure okay and there is another sensation called as chemoreceptors chemoreceptors another kind of receptors called as chemoreceptors and these chemoreceptors are taking the sensations from the carotid body carotid body so here v here stands for v here stands for carotid sinus next what does a stand for a stands for the efferent limb of gag reflex see again i am telling you there are two types one is efferent another one is efferent efferent is going out efferent is the sensation always the sensations carry carried from the efferent limb right the motor sensations are carried by the efferent limb so here we have got the efferent limb of gag reflex efferent limb of gag reflex okay after a we have got s t e s stands for somato sensation s stands for somato sensation now when it comes to somato sensation now tell me what is this somato sensation is that somato sensation is taken up by the posterior one third of the tongue posterior one third of the tongue middle ear as well as the eustachian tube so it is taken up by the posterior one third of the tongue middle ear as well as the eustachian tube as well as the eustachian tube okay now the next important thing vas T E. What does V A S T stand for? T stands for the taste perception. Okay. So T T stands for the taste perception. Now, when it comes to the taste perception, it takes the taste sensations from the anterior or the posterior. It takes the taste sensations from the posterior one third of the tongue. It takes the taste sensations from the posterior one third of the tongue. Posterior one third of the tongue. right through which branch that is through lingual branch through which branch that is through lingual branch if you remember when we discuss the facial nerve 
right so when we discuss the facial nerve taste sensations from the anterior two third of the tongue is taken up by the chordae tympani now i am discussing that the lingual branch takes the sensations from the posterior one third of the tongue okay now let us see what are the motor sensations here so in the glossopharyngeal nerve we discussed about the sensory now we'll discuss mainly about the motor again whenever the discussion of motor branches come you have to know there are two different types of motor innervations so one is somatic somatic is purely supplying your muscles and parasympathetic is there is some kind of parasympathetic action parasympathetic as well as the somatic now when it comes to somatic what is somatic here this glossopharyngeal nerve glossopharyngeal nerve why pharyn glossopharyngeal the pharyngeal itself uh, states that it is supplying your pharyngeal muscles so if i innervate the pharyngeal muscle if i innervate the pharyngeal muscle don't you think the patient can swallow now swallowing is somatic action or parasympathetic it is a somatic action so somatic action is swallowing now whereas the parasympathetic action is salivation salivation lacrimation all these are parasympathetic actions right but the glossopharyngeal carries out salivation now when i tell swallowing here exactly which muscle are you contracting i am contracting a pharyngeal muscle what is that pharyngeal muscle that is your stylopharynges so whenever your stylopharynges is contracted the pharynx will be elevated whenever the pharynx will be elevated that will be easy to swallow the things okay so here in swallowing you are contracting the stylopharynges muscle stylopharynges muscle and this stylopharynges muscle will aid in what elevation of the pharynx elevation of the pharynx very very important thing now coming to the most important nerve uh, the largest one that is called as your vagus nerve that is your 10th pair of cranial nerve so by this you might know that vagus nerve is both sensory as well as motor okay there are two different types of sensations that are carried out one is sensory sensations another one is motor now when it comes to sensory again there are two important actions here there are two important functions one is somatic another one is visceral one is somatic another one is visceral another one is visceral okay now when it comes to somatic and when it comes to visceral what are the important things when it comes to somatic right it takes the somatic sensations from the posterior wall of external artery canal if you remember we have discussed sensations from the anterior wall of external auditory canal where did we discuss here anterior wall of external artery canal is taken up by the trigeminal nerve sensory branch of the trigeminal nerve now i'm discussing the posterior wall of the extern the external auditory canal is taken up by the vagus nerve now make those differences in your mind okay so posterior wall of external auditory canal posterior wall of external auditory canal and second important thing is that it also takes the sensation above the glottis that is supraglottic region that is the supraglottic region supraglottic region not only that even from the trachea okay even from the larynx trachea as well as the larynx now next important thing is the visceral sensations visceral sensations in the sense what a visceral sensation is in taste sensation so taste sensation from where again from the same region that is a supraglottic region so it will also take the taste sensations from the supraglottic region supraglottic region okay and the next important thing is that additionally are there any kind of visceral sensations that are carried out additional visceral sensations are taken up from aortic body right so in the aortic body what are the receptors you have got you have got the baro receptors right now when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the visceral sensations we have got something called as aortic body now what is carried out through this aortic body that is you this aortic body is consisting of baro receptors baro receptors and these baro receptors are for the blood pressure this is one of the important thing you need to know right so this is about the sensory right sensory is very easy divided into two somatic as well as visceral 
somatic is a posterior wall of arteric canal and supraglottic region again taste sensations from the supraglottic region and the aortic body with the baroreceptors okay coming to the motor there are two types again somatic parasympathetic now when it comes to somatic what does this vagus nerve do it is responsible for gag reflex it is responsible for the speech it is also responsible for swallowing okay three important things so when it comes to the motor actions when it comes to the motor actions there are two important things what are these two important things one is called as the somatic one is called as a somatic and the other one is called as a parasympathetic somatic as well as the parasympathetic okay now when it comes to the somatic one action is swallowing one action is swallowing so swallowing is done by how many muscles swallowing is mainly done by three important muscles so what are these three important muscles which are responsible for the swallowing one is middle pharyngeal constrictor inferior pharyngeal constrictor and palatoglossus muscle okay middle pharyngeal constrictor another one is inferior pharyngeal constrictor and next one is palatoglossus palatoglossus muscle now the next important thing is gag reflex the next important thing is gag reflex and third important thing is it is responsible for the speech now when you call it as it is responsible for the speech which nerve is responsible that is your laryngeal nerve we will discuss about this laryngeal nerve and its details later on okay specifically speaking which laryngeal nerve that is your recurrent laryngeal nerve recurrent laryngeal nerve recurrent laryngeal nerve okay right so this is all about your somatic sensations now when it comes to the parasympathetic you know that the main parasympathetic input to the um, uh, from the vagus nerve is mainly to the heart what does it do it supplies to your sa node and it slows down your sa node it supplies to your av node and it slows down to your av node so sa node and av node when they are slowed down that would lead to what decreased heart rate decreased heart rate not only decrease heart rate they will also cause vasodilation and what will happen when there is vasodilation the blood pressure will fall down okay so this is the action of the vagus nerve and the next important nerve we shall we shall, we shall be discussing right now after the vagus is your 11th pair of cranial nerve that is your accessory spinal nerve what is that that is your accessory spinal nerve accessory spinal nerve or your 11th pair of cranial nerve your accessory spinal nerve supplies to the muscles on the back there are two important muscles remember by the mnemonic a s and t okay so overall that is sat okay s stands for spinal a stands for accessory t stands for trapezius okay but actually there are two important muscles you can remember like this one is terno cleidomastoid muscle okay and the other one is called as your trapezius muscle sternocleidomastoid muscle and your trapezius muscle so overall what will be the mnemonic s a and t s a and t s a and t okay next the next important nerve uh, that is 12th pair of cranial nerve what is that hypoglossal nerve hypoglossal nerve is your 12th pair of cranial nerve and very simple action the only one action is it is responsible for tongue protrusion tongue protrusion so let us just fastly recap the things which we have discussed right now so we started our discussion with the first pair of first pair of cranial nerve that is your what that is your olfactory nerve only one action smell optic will be definitely vision right one is pupillary right reflex another one is vision third important thing here is oculomotor nerve again mot uh, it has got somatic as well as a parasympathetic somatic is eyelid opening and eye eyelid movement eyelid opening is levator palpebra superioris next movement is superior rectus inferior medial and inferior oblique as i already told you lr6 so4 r3 lr6 lateral rectus is supplied by sixth pair of cranial nerve superior oblique is supplied by fourth pair of cranial nerve and the rest are supplied by the third pair of cranial nerve next important thing is the trochlear nerve which is responsible for your eye movement 
okay eye movement so eye movement is done by your superior oblique muscle coming to the trigeminal now there are two parts here sensory as well as the motor when it comes to the sensory, uh, remember this mnemonic, many tigers jump making ants silly. M stands for the mucous membranes over here, right, mucous membranes from the oral cavity and nasal cavity. Next is the teeth, it takes sensations from the temporomandibular joint, very very important question, right, and also meninges, anterior wall of external auditory canal and also somato sensation from the anterior two third of the tongue. So this mnemonic is many is mucus, T for teeth. J for joint, again M for meninges, A, T, A, S, A stands for anterior wall of external artery, S stands for somato sensation from anterior two third of the tongue. When it comes to motor muscles of mastication, you know it, jaw jerk reflexes, meseter, keep that thing in mind. Muscle which closes the jaw is medial pterygoid, opens the jaw is lateral pterygoid. Next mat is mylohyoid, anterior belly of diagnostic, tensor tympani and tensor veli palatine. Coming to abducens, only one muscle that is rattal rectus. Facial nerve, sensory and motor, sensory is taste sensations from the anterior two-third of the tongue with the help of which nerve that is your cauda tympani. Coming to the motor, two sensations, somatic and parasympathetic. Somatic is F-E-J-H. Facial expression, eyelid closing, right, jaw opening and hyoid elevation. Additionally, two other uh, reflexes, one is called as corneal, another one is echoist. Coming to parasympathetic, there is salivation, lacrimation and lacrimation reflex. Next important thing is vestibular cochlear nerve, two important actions balance and hearing. Balance is vestibular nerve and hearing is cochlear nerve, very very important. Glossopharyngeal nerve is sensory as well as motor, sensory is waste, V stands for uh, visceral sensation from the carotid sinus that is baroreceptors. Next chemoreceptors are located in the carotid body that take the uh, saturation levels like oxygen and carbon dioxide, partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And a stands for efferent limb of gag reflex. S stands for somato sensation from the posterior one third, middle ear and eustachian tube. Taste perception is again the posterior one third of the tongue that is a lingual branch. When it comes to the motor, there are two important things. One is the somatic, another one is the parasympathetic. Somatic is again swallowing with the help of stylopharyngeus muscle which will elevate the hyoid bone and parasympathetic is the action called as salivation. Coming to the vagus now again sensory and motor, sensory is both somatic and visceral. Somatic is the from the posterior wall of external artery canal and also supraglottic region. And this is all follows the remaining po important points over here. Okay, right. Now we shall be discussing another important concept that is your cavernous sinus. Cavernous sinus. Now if you look at this particular cavernous sinus, what are the important things which you can see? So first of all, uh, let me draw this cavernous sinus. So this is basically a bit of triangular shaped structure. Okay. So let us say that this is the rough picture of cavernous sinus which I am drawing right now. Right. So this particular thing over here is called as your cavernous sinus. Okay. Now next important thing you need to know is that you know that in the middle cranial fossa, you have got a saddle shaped structure that is called a cella tarsica of your sphenoid bone, right? So let us say that this particular structure over here is called as cella tarsica of the sphenoid bone, okay? So this is your cella tarsica of your sphenoid bone. Now, after that, <coughs> now after that, here you have got a sinus like this. This particular sinus is called a sphenoid sinus. What is this? Phenoid sinus. And where is your pituitary gland located? So this is the location of your pituitary gland like this. So there is one layer which is covering this cavernous sinus and this layer is called as your meningeal layer and an other layer that is covering the wall of the middle cranial fossa, the inner cavity of middle cranial fossa is called as the endosteal layer. Okay. For example, see this particular red color layer which I am showing it to you right now. Now this particular red color layer is covering your pituitary gland, this is also covering your cavernous sinus, right? So this is called as meningeal layer because it is present towards the meninges. Next important layer with the pink which I am drawing right now, you see this particular layer is covering the bony surface. So this is called as your endosteal layer, okay? So there are two important layers here. What are those two important layers? This one over here is called as your meningeal layer. 
this is called as your meningeal layer and this particular layer is called as your endosteal layer endosteal layer okay and what is this particular sinus over here this is called as your sphenoid sinus this particular sinus over here is called as your sphenoid sinus now let us write down the structures which we have written over here the first important thing that if you look at the cavernous sinus if you look at the cavernous sinus so what did we discuss cavernous sinus is having two important layers if you just look at only the cavernous sinus outside the cavernous sinus you have a covering called as meningeal layer of the dura mater you know dura mater is having two important layers one is called as a meningeal layer another one is called as endosteal layer so outside you have got is the meningeal layer you have got is the meningeal layer of your dura mater and inside and inside you have got the endosteal layer inside you have got the endosteal layer of the dura mater okay you see here the outside layer is the meningeal layer this one and inside layer is the endosteal layer now if you look at the cavernous sinus itself you see this cavity in the center is called as your cavernous sinus i hope you know this thing right so there are no doubts here this cavity you call it as a cavernous sinus now this cavernous sinus let me draw a line and tell you see this particular line which i'm drawing right now this forms the lateral wall of cavernous sinus so on to the lateral wall of cavernous sinus what cranial nerves do you have so there is third cranial nerve there is fourth cranial nerve there is 51 and there is 52 51 in the sense v1 and v2 so you have got uh, third cranial nerve that is the oculomotor nerve trochlear nerve and you have got ophthalmic branch of trigeminal as well as the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve so on to the lateral wall okay let us discuss on to the lateral wall on to the lateral wall what are the structures we have got we have got the third pair of cranial nerve fourth 51 as well as 52 as well as 52 so what do you mean by 51 over here this 51 is nothing but called as ophthalmic branch ophthalmic branch and 52 over here is called as your maxillary branch ophthalmic branch is v1 maxillary branch is v2 okay next important thing next important thing is that within the cavernous sinus within the cavernous sinus itself we have got an artery you see there is an artery here this artery is called as internal carotid artery surrounding this internal carotid artery you see a sympathetic plexus surrounding this internal carotid artery you see a sympathetic plexus you see a sympathetic plexus now if there is injury to this sympathetic plexus right then you will come across a condition called as horner syndrome okay so whenever i tell horner syndrome from the upper limb also i have discussed you might have known this Horner syndrome is mainly because of what and the damage to what is that the damage to the ventral ramus of T1. So surrounding this, you have got this plexus called as sympathetic plexus. Okay, if there is uh, this sympathetic plexus is called as T1 sympathetic plexus, and if you remember from the upper limb itself, I have told you that if there is injury to this T1 sympathetic plexus, that would lead to what? That would lead to Horner syndrome. so the next important point i would like to mention over here is that this internal carotid artery is surrounded okay internal carotid artery is surrounded by what it is surrounded by t1 sympathetic plexus okay now this t1 sympathetic plexus if there is an injury this would lead to a condition called as horner syndrome horner syndrome okay this would lead to a condition called as horner syndrome now in the horner syndrome you know the thing what is that you will see unilateral meiosis unilateral ptosis and unilateral anhidrosis right so on one side there will be no sweating so what are the things you see you see meiosis you see ptosis you see anhidrosis meiosis ptosis as well as anhidrosis these are the three important things you would see over here in case of horner syndrome okay right the next important thing what is the next important thing you need to know here you even have got another pair of cranial nerve over here that is 6 that is your abducens nerve 
so this abducens nerve has got the longest intradural root now where is this sixth pair of cranial nerve located this sixth pair of cranial nerve is also located within the sinus so abducens nerve has got a longest intradural root and this thing all of you know it that it has got the longest intradural root and which is located within the um, cavernous sinus so this particular one is your cavernous sinus cavernous sinus okay so once again regarding this cavernous sinus as i told you it has got two layers outer surrounding the cavernous sinus outer layer is the meningeal layer inner layer is the endosteal layer and what are the things that are located here 3 4 5 1 5 2 okay and internal carotid artery sub, uh, supplied by surrounded by a t1 sympathetic flexes that injury will lead to horner syndrome so this is all the important things which you need to know regarding the cavernous sinus Right guys, so now we shall be discussing uh, some of the very important things in case of the triangles, okay. So in the neck region, we have got two important triangles. What are those two important triangles? We have got, we have got anterior triangle as well as we have got the posterior triangle in the neck. So we have got the anterior triangle of the neck. We have also got the posterior triangle of the neck. Okay, so first we shall discuss about the anterior triangle. Now here you can come across uh, two important muscles over here, rather three, right? So this muscle which is attached all the way from the mastoid process down till the sternum and the clavicle, this is called a sternocleidomastoid muscle. Next down here to from the mandible all the way, from the mandible all the way to the hyoid, from the hyoid again back to the mastoid, you have got one muscle. This muscle is called as diagastric muscle. Now this diagastric muscle is having two important bellies. What are those two important bellies over here? See this is called as the anterior belly of diagastric. This is called as anterior belly of anterior belly of diagastric muscle. And this one is called as a posterior belly of diagastric muscle. Now both these bellies where are they arching with the help of a tendinous arch that is located on the hyoid bone. Okay, and down here, this particular muscle over here, you call it as a omohyoid muscle. This is your omohyoid muscle. This is your omohyoid muscle which is located down. Okay, now important thing is that first of all, where is this anterior triangle of your neck? So, if you look at the anterior triangle, uh, anterior triangle is having three important borders. What are those three important borders? You see, in the front, let me use another color. You see in the front here you have got this particular structure right so what is this this is called as a midline of the neck okay on the top what do you have you have got the mandible on the top on the uh, inferior laterally what inferior laterally in the sense see inferior laterally okay this is inferior and this is laterally inferior laterally what do you have you have got sternocleidomastoid so overall if you see you can see a triangle like this right this triangle is having three borders anteriorly there is midline of the neck superiorly there is the lower part or the inferior surface of the mandible inferior laterally you have got the sternocleidomastoid muscle okay so first of all let us write down this and then we shall go to the triangles uh, the subdivisions of each and every triangle here so anterior triangle of the neck anterior triangle of the neck so this anterior triangle of the neck is having three important parts. What are those three important parts? Anterior, superior has anterior, superior as well as inferior lateral part. Anterior border, superior border and inferior lateral border. Anterior border what is having? Midline of the front of the neck. So the midline of the front of the neck midline of the front of the neck gives you the anterior border coming to the superior border what do we have we have got the mandible in the superior border coming to the inferior lateral border what do we have we have got the sterno cleidomastoid muscle sterno cleidomastoid muscle these are the three important things that form the anterior triangle of the neck now within this anterior triangle there are some more triangles let us say there are four important triangles that are located within this anterior triangle so first important triangle what is this first important triangle the first important triangle is your submandibular triangle okay so you can see over here just beneath the mandible you see this 
triangle with a green color shading here you see right so this particular triangle is called as a sub mandibular triangle after this sub mandibular triangle i will discuss about each and everything in detail after this sub mandibular triangle you see this particular triangle located over here this is called as your carotid triangle okay what is this carotid triangle next after that you have got <coughs> after that you see this particular yellow color shaded triangle over here this is called as your sub mental triangle over here right now after this sub mental triangle what do you have you see the last triangle over here this is called as your muscular triangle so how many triangles four important triangles one is below the mandible called as sub mandibular triangle and next carotid region that is called as carotid triangle and next sub mental triangle and finally we have got the muscular triangle so let us discuss one by one in detail now okay the first important triangle is sub mandibular triangle the first important is sub mandibular triangle we shall also try discussing what are the contents which are located in the sub mandibular triangle okay now sub mandibular triangle if you look here this is your sub mandibular triangle now this sub mandibular triangle is bounded by three important structures what are those three important structures so on the top here you have got the lower surface of the mandible right so it is bounded by the mandible and it is bounded by the anterior belly and the posterior belly of diagastric. So there is mandible here, there is anterior belly of diagastric, posterior belly of diagastric. So three structures together they form what? The sub mandibular triangle. Okay. So this sub mandibular triangle is bounded by mandible, anterior belly of diagastric and posterior belly of diagastric anterior belly of diagastric and posterior belly of diagastric now within this submandibular triangle what are the contents this is a very important thing within this submandibular triangle you have got a gland called submandibular salivary gland apart from this you have also got hypoglossal nerve and facial nerve these are the three important things so if you look at the contents if you look at the contents there are three important contents which you can see the first important content is the sub mandibular salivary gland see below the mandible sub mandible so sub mandibular salivary gland salivary gland and second important thing is that where is your where is your sub mandibular triangle located below your tongue Below your tongue is this one. This is called as your submandibular triangle. So below your tongue is hypoglossal nerve, right? So the nerve passes there is hypoglossal nerve, hypoglossal nerve, and the third important thing is your facial nerve also, your facial nerve also. So these are the three important contents and these are the borders. Coming to the second important triangle that is called as your carotid triangle. that is called as your carotid triangle now when it comes to the carotid triangle now you tell me carotid triangle borders on the back side posteriorly we have got a border here right so this is called as the sternocleidomastoid muscle right next we have got the posterior belly of diagastric muscle posterior belly of diagastric and this is called as the superior belly of omohyoid so sternocleidomastoid posterior belly of diagastric muscle and superior belly of omohyoid muscle three of them together form a triangle called as carotid triangle okay so carotid triangle is formed by three important things one is called as sternocleidomastoid muscle sternocleidomastoid muscle second important thing is the posterior belly of diagastric muscle and the third important thing is the superior belly of omohyoid superior belly of omohyoid muscle three important things sternocleidomastoid posterior belly of uh, diagastric muscle and superior belly of omohyoid muscle now within this carotid triangle what is the structure we have got why it is called as a carotid triangle because we have got carotid artery within this 
So if you look at the contents of this carotid triangle, very, very, very important contents. The first important content is the carotid artery and that is the reason why you call it as a carotid triangle. You have got the carotid artery. And second important thing, there is a very important vein called as internal jugular vein. Internal jugular vein. And third important thing you have got is a vagus nerve. So there are three important, main important structures. One artery, one vein and one nerve. Artery is your carotid artery, vein is your internal jugular vein and nerve is your vagus nerve. Okay. Next important thing. Next important, I mean third important triangle which we have to discuss is a submental triangle. And remember one thing, this submental triangle is an unpaid triangle. Okay. Now this submental triangle, it is located down here above the hyoid bone. So this submental triangle, one side it is having what? Anterior belly of the diastric as well as the hyoid bone. And see, here this is the anterior belly of diagastric and here is the hyoid bone, okay. And this entire triangle which you can see over here is called as your submental triangle, okay. If it was paid, then I would also mention that there is this midline of the neck, but it is not paid, right. So there is only one triangle all the way from the right to the left here, that is your anterior belly of diagastric and your hyoid bone. So the third important triangle, so the third important triangle is your submental triangle. Submental triangle. So submental triangle is a part of your anterior triangle. So it is having what and by the way, this is your unpaid triangle. So it is having what it is having what it is bounded by it is bounded by anterior belly of diagastric. Anterior belly of diagastric muscle this is one and the second important thing is your hyoid bone hyoid bone as well as the anterior belly of your diagastric muscle now coming to the fourth important thing the fourth important triangle that is your muscular triangle as i've already okay let me write it down that is called as your muscular triangle that is your muscular triangle okay now i have already mentioned it here now what is this muscular triangle what it is it is a paid triangle not an unpaid triangle now muscular triangle is having what it is first it is having a midline right next on the top it is having what it is having a hyoid bone on the top on the posteriorly what it is having it is having your next back what do you have you have got your sternocleidomastoid muscle in the same way the superior belly of omohyoid muscle so there is midline here so there is midline, there is hyoid bone, there is superior belly of homohyoid as well as your sternocleidomastoid. So this particular triangle over here is called as your muscular triangle. Okay. So this is your muscular triangle. Now in this muscular triangle, uh, let me write down the structures. One is the midline of the neck. One is the midline of the neck. Okay. Second important thing is you have got the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Third important thing you have got is the hyoid bone. You have got is the hyoid bone. Next you have got is the inferior, inferior or super, superior belly of homohyoid, right? So I'm sorry, this is superior belly of homohyoid muscle. Superior belly of your homohyoid muscle. Right, so these are the structures that are located in the muscular triangle. Now, if you discuss about the contents of the muscular triangle, what contents can there be? So, all of you know that this is the muscular triangle. Here you have got your thyroid gland. Within the thyroid, you have got parathyroid. So, thyroid and parathyroid are the contents of your muscular triangle. So, your thyroid gland as well as your Parathyroid gland are the contents of your muscular triangle over here. Now, this completes the discussion of your anterior triangles of the neck. So, once again, anterior triangles of the neck, this entire triangle which I am drawing right now is your anterior triangle. This anterior triangle is having uh, some other triangles over here. So, again, this particular triangle over here is called as your submental triangle. Okay. And this particular triangle over here is called, what is this triangle over here called as after submental triangle? So this triangle over here just beneath the mandible is called as your uh, submandibular triangle, 
right and this lo1 over here is called as your sub mental triangle okay and this one over here is called as your carotid triangle and finally this triangle over here is called as your muscular triangle muscular triangle so there are three four three to four important triangles here all these triangles they form the anterior part of your neck now after this the next important triangles which we shall be discussing over here is the posterior triangles okay now coming to this posterior triangles first of all you have to know what is this posterior triangle made up of overall overall what is this posterior triangle made up of see overall if you look here this posterior triangle is this one what is this there is a sternocleidomastoid muscle okay exactly speaking the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid you see this is called as the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid and this is called as a posterior border of sternocleidomastoid so posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle posteriorly what do you have you have got the trapezius this is your trapezius posteriorly and inferiorly what do you have you have got the middle third of the clavicle see from here till here this is the middle third of the clavicle okay not the complete clavicle only the middle part you see the middle third of the clavicle okay so what are the three important things that make up this triangle one is the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid middle third of the clavicle and the trapezius muscle three of them together you call this as a posterior triangle okay so first let me write down the borders of this posterior triangle okay so posterior triangle posterior triangle of the neck region when it comes to the posterior triangle of the neck region you have to know anteriorly what it is having anterior and you should also know posterior and inferior anteriorly posteriorly and inferiorly okay so anteriorly what do you have the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid anteriorly you have got the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle posteriorly what do you have you have got the anterior border of trapezius you have got the anterior border of trapezius inferiorly what do you have you have got the middle third of the clavicle middle third of the clavicle middle third of the clavicle forms the inferior border now after this the next important thing next important thing is that if you look at the posterior triangle right so this is your posterior triangle right now if you look at this particular posterior triangle within that you have got one more muscle you see there is omohyoid muscle inferior belly then where was superior belly so here there was superior belly of omohyoid you remember and this is the inferior belly of omohyoid superior belly of omohyoid was in the anterior triangles and now inferior belly of omohyoid is present in the posterior triangle now this inferior belly of omohyoid is again dividing this posterior triangle into two more triangles so one triangle above the omohyoid one triangle below the omohyoid like this one triangle above the omohyoid is called as occipital triangle and one triangle below you see this this is below the omohyoid muscle this is called as supraclavicular because this triangle is exactly above the clavicle other name is subclavian triangle or supraclavicular triangle okay so omohyoid inferior belly of omohyoid so here inferior belly of omohyoid is dividing the posterior triangle into two other triangles okay so above above this inferior belly of omohyoid you call it as occipital triangle you call it as occipital triangle and next below below the inferior belly of omohyoid you call it as a subclavian triangle you call it as a subclavian triangle or supraclavicular triangle supraclavicular triangle okay subclavian triangle or supraclavicular triangle subclavian triangle or supraclavicular triangle okay so these are the two important triangles which you need to know now let us discuss about the occipital triangle first in the occipital triangle also let us discuss about the anterior posterior and inferior border let us discuss about the occipital triangle 
okay occipital triangle within this occipital triangle let us discuss about the anterior border let us discuss about the posterior border let us discuss about the inferior border anterior border posterior border as well as the inferior border now look at the anterior border here what is the anterior border made up of you know now what is this anterior border made up of it is made up of the posterior belly of your sternocleidomastoid muscle so anterior border is made up of what posterior belly of your sternocleidomastoid muscle posterior border is made up of what the anterior border of your trapezius muscle this is your anterior border of your trapezius muscle okay and next important thing inferiorly what do you have got inferiorly you have got the inferior belly of omohyoid so posterior belly of posterior border of sternocleidomastoid inferior uh, belly of omohyoid and anterior part or anterior border of trapezius this forms your occipital triangle okay so let us write down the borders of occipital triangle over here anteriorly you have got the posterior border posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle next you have got the anterior border of trapezius anterior border of trapezius and inferior what do you have got inferior belly of omohyoid inferior belly of omohyoid muscle okay now within this what are the contents now this is very 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 important what are the contents that are located here what are the contents the first important content which the, the nerve which supplies to the trapezius which we already discussed that is spinal accessory nerve spinal accessory nerve okay now what is the second important thing there are cutaneous branches and muscular branches of cervical plexus there are cutaneous and muscular branches of cervical plexus cutaneous and muscular branches of cervical plexus and what is the third important thing there is uppermost part of the brachial plexus uppermost part of brachial plexus uppermost part of the brachial plexus and also there is supraclavicular nerve supraclavicular nerve so these are the four important structures that are located there now after this four important structures the next important uh, triangle over here as i told you that is subclavian triangle so there is another triangle called as subclavian triangle so what is the other name of this subclavian triangle i told you supraclavicular triangle supra clavicular triangle this one also has got an anterior border it has also got a posterior border it has also got a superior border anterior posterior as well as a superior border now let us look at the anterior border posterior border as well as a superior border anterior border is formed by the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid see anterior border is formed by the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid posterior border is formed by the anterior border of trapezius so there are three important borders over here also you can see that the anterior border posterior and superior anterior border from this picture itself you can uh, figure it out that the anterior border is formed by what posterior border of sternocleidomastoid posterior border of posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle posterior border is formed by the anterior border of trapezius anterior border of trapezius and superiorly we have got the inferior belly of omohyoid inferior belly of this omohyoid muscle okay so if you look what are the contents over here what are the contents we have got let us look at the triangle and its contents over here so in this you have got an artery you can see a small artery over here what is this artery this artery is called as the third part of subclavian artery okay so this artery over here is the third part of subclavian artery next the vein which you have over here is called as your subclavian vein 
subclavian vein. Now, if you look up, what is the vein that is draining into subclavian vein? So, this long vein, this is called as your external jugular vein. External jugular vein is the one which is draining into your subclavian vein. Apart from that, you have got the nerves over here. What are these nerves? These are the trunks of brachial plexus. Okay. What are these? These are the trunks of brachial plexus. Trunks of brachial plexus. Next important thing is that you have got a nerve here. What is this particular nerve here which you can see? This is called as your phrenic nerve. What is this? This is called as your phrenic nerve. Okay. So, these are the important structures that are located over here. These are the important structures which you can see that they are the contents of this particular triangle over here. Okay. So, once again, we started our discussion with the anterior and posterior triangles of the neck. So, these are your anterior triangles. Within this anterior, there are four important things. One is called as your carotid triangle. Another one is called as your submandibular triangle. Third is anterior belly of digastric. Uh, just below that, you have got your submental triangle and next you have got the muscular triangle. Right now coming to the posterior triangles, we discussed two important triangles. One is occipital, another one is your subclavian. Now within this occipital triangle, if I ask you the floor of the occipital triangle is made up of what muscles? It is made up of semispinalis capitis, splenius capitis, levator scapulae and medial scalene muscle. Okay, so these are the muscles over here. So what are the muscles of mastication which you have got? So basically if you see here, we have got four important muscles of mastication. Okay, so here what are, this is the mandible and let us locate these four important muscles of mastication. So exactly here, right on the coronoid process, right? So here you have got a muscle and this muscle is called as your temporalis muscle. So what is the name of this muscle? This muscle over here is called as temporalis muscle. Okay, after this temporalis muscle, see here you have got another muscle. This muscle over here is called as your lateral pterygoid muscle. What is this? This is your lateral, lateral pterygoid muscle. And after that, here you have got another muscle. Here you have got another muscle. This particular muscle which is located over here is called as your medial pterygoid muscle. So this is your medial pterygoid. medial pterygoid muscle okay so you have got your lateral pterygoid medial pterygoid temporalis and finally we should locate another muscle also here this particular muscle which is located here is called as your what is this masseter muscle this is called as your masseter muscle so again i am telling you four muscles and let us write down their actions also so one muscle over here you call it as the temporalis muscle Next muscle is called as a lateral pterygoid muscle. Lateral pterygoid muscle. Third important muscle over here is the medial pterygoid muscle. Medial pterygoid muscle. Fourth important muscle is your masseter muscle. Masseter muscle. So out of these four important muscles, what are the actions of each and every muscle? Coming to temporalis muscle, temporalis muscle is responsible for the retraction and elevation of the mandible. Okay, retraction and elevation of the mandible. When it comes to lateral pterygoid, protraction and depression. So, protraction and depression of the mandible. Responsible for protraction and depression of the mandible. Okay. Medial pterygoid is responsible for elevation of the mandible, elevation of the mandible and masseter muscle is responsible also for elevation of the mandible. Okay, so these are the important actions. Next important thing is that you have to locate the structures. So if this is a laryngoscope image that is given to you, you have to locate the structures that are located within this laryngoscope image. First of all, this is your larynx. This is your larynx and this is your larynx, you are seeing it on a laryngoscope. So you have to locate the structures which are located here. Very important thing here is that first of all, you see these swollen structures here, right? You see these swollen structures on either side. These swollen structures are nothing but called as arytenoid cartilages. So this is nothing but called as your 
एरिटेनॉइड कार्टिलेज दिस इज योर एरिटेनॉइड कार्टिलेज ओके नाउ इन बिटवीन द टू एरिटेनॉइड कार्टिलेजेस दिस पॉइंट हियर इज कॉल्ड एज इंटर एरिटेनॉइड इनसिसुरे व्हाट इज दैट दैट इज योर इंटर एरिटेनॉइड इंटर एरिटेनॉइड इनसिसुरे इंटर एरिटेनॉइड इनसिसुरे ओके एरिटेनॉइड कार्टिलेजेस इंटर एरिटेनॉइड इनसिसुरे next important thing is that where are your vocal cords you see these two structures these two structures over here are called as your vocal cords so these two structures are here called as your vocal cords okay on either side of the vocal cords you see the folds here these folds are called as vestibular folds these folds here are called as vestibular folds and down here this particular shape uh, leaf shape structure is called as your epiglottis epiglottis so these are some of the very important structures which you have to identify and second thing just beneath the epiglottis you see a structure that is in the median region in the center this is called as median glosso epiglottic fold what is this this is called as median glosso epiglottic fold median glosso epiglottic fold so this is the very important image which you need to understand over here one is called as a inter arytenoid incisure next is arytenoid cartilage vocal cords vestibular folds epiglottis and median uh, glosso epiglottic fold okay now next important thing is that if you are looking in the ventral view so this is how the cartilage appears on the ventral view if you are looking the ventral view this is how the cartilage appears on the ventral view so here the first important thing which you need to know here is that this particular bone which you can see over here is called as your hyoid bone what is this bone this is called as your hyoid bone now next important thing what is this particular cartilage over here this cartilage is called as thyroid cartilage this particular cartilage is called as thyroid cartilage okay this is your thyroid cartilage next where is your cricoid cartilage see this one over here is called as your cricoid cartilage okay now between the thyroid and the cricoid the membrane which you have got is called as a thyro what is this thyroid as well as the uh, hyoid the membrane which you have got over here like this between the thyroid and the hyoid the membrane which you have got over here is called as a thyrohyoid membrane thyro hyoid membrane now in the same way we have got a membrane that is present between the thyroid and the cricoid here so this is your cricothyroid membrane what is this crico thyroid membrane so there are two membranes here one is thyrohyoid another one is cricothyroid right now if you look at the thyroid cartilage here thyroid cartilage has got two important horns okay one is called as a superior horn another one is inferior horn now, all of you just look here so this is your thyroid cartilage here right so here you see these two horns these two horns are called as a superior horns and these two horns over here are called as inferior horns now if you have to locate over here you see this particular horn over here this is called as superior horn superior horn and here the horn which you have got over here is called as your inferior horn so two important horns superior horn as well as the inferior horn if you do the section of the larynx over here basically the larynx is divided into three important structures okay so the larynx is divided into three important sections what are those three important sections of the larynx one is above the glottis is called as the supraglottic space below the glottis is called as the subglottic space and the center we have got the laryngeal ventricle okay so three important things one is called as the supra glottic space we have got the infraglottic space supraglottic space we have got the infraglottic space we have also got the laryngeal laryngeal opening that is a laryngeal ventricle laryngeal ventricle okay now if you can look at this picture over here where is your laryngeal ventricle anything in the center is your laryngeal ventricle okay so you can see this is your laryngeal ventricle this is your laryngeal ventricle okay this part is your laryngeal ventricle so above this laryngeal ventricle you called as supraglottic space 
above this you call it as supra glottic space over here now below that what do you what is the space subglottic space below that there is subglottic space so that's what i was telling you there are three important structures what are those three supraglottic subglottic and laryngeal ventricle in the center right and down here if you see where is your trachea see this part is your trachea so subglottic space continues down as trachea so but whatever it is these are the three major important things which you have to remember okay supraglottic space laryngeal ventricle and subglottic space okay now if you look at the cartilages what are the different kinds of cartilages which you have got in the larynx so you have studied this long 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 ago right regarding the cartilages there are basically two different types of cartilages what are they one is called as the unpaid cartilage one is called as the unpaid cartilages another one is called as a paid cartilages unpaid as well as a paid cartilages what are the unpaid cartilages cricoid is an unpaid cartilage epiglottis is un unpaid cartilage thyroid is unpaid cartilage you can see here right in this picture itself here epiglottis is not seen but you see here this thyroid right you see this thyroid how many thyroid cartilages are there only one so thyroid is an unpaid cartilage next down here what is this this is your cricoid only one and next you have got the epiglottis that is also only one so three important cartilages so what are these three important one is called as cricoid another one is called as thyroid cartilage and the last one is called as your epi glottis so these are the three important cartilages coming to the paid cartilages what are the paid cartilages which you have got one is called as the arytenoid cartilages arytenoid are the paid cartilage next you have got is the corniculate cartilage arytenoid corniculate and next you have got is the cuneiform cartilage three important arytenoid corniculate as well as the cuneiform okay now let us uh, look at some of the very important structures which are located over here let us look at all these types of cartilages over here and by the way one cartilage here which you also know and this is from the posterior side of the larynx on the back side okay so this particular cartilage which you can see over here is called as your epiglottis what is this this is your epiglottis okay next important thing down here what are the other cartilages which we have got see here we have got two important cartilages which are very 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 small like a corn okay that is called corniculate cartilage you see this particular tiny cartilage which you have got is your corniculate cartilage how many corniculate cartilages are there two how many epiglottis are there one only one epiglottis just beneath the corniculate cartilage you see you have got one more cartilage like this here right so this cartilage is called as arytenoid cartilages arytenoid cartilage so how many arytenoid cartilages are there again these are also two on either side we have got two arytenoid cartilages next after that here you can see superior horn of thyroid and inferior horn of thyroid where is that you see this is called as the superior horn of thyroid superior horn of thyroid cartilage okay and not thyroid thyroid cartilage okay thyroid cartilage and where are the inferior horn you see this is called as the inferior horn of thyroid cartilage inferior horn of the thyroid cartilage and finally you know where is your cricoid right so this part over here is called as your cricoid cartilage cricoid cartilage which is very important and next important thing is that on the posterior side itself on the posterior side itself if you can zoom in and see you see a small aperture here where is this aperture located aperture is located on the what is this thyrohyoid membrane right so what is this aperture that is located on the thyrohyoid membrane on either side we have got this aperture this is a aperture for passing the superior laryngeal artery and superior laryngeal nerve so there are two important structures that pass through this so this is the aperture that is located on see this is your hyoid this is your thyroid thyrohyoid membrane on that you have got this aperture and with it, through this aperture you have got superior laryngeal artery that is passing and superior 
laryngeal nerve that is passing two important things superior laryngeal artery and superior laryngeal nerve these are the two important things that are passing through this aperture okay so this is one of the very important picture which you need to know definitely there will be a question what is this particular picture is that whenever there is an emergency for example you intubate the patient and if the intubation fails so what is the next step we need to do next step we need to do is cricothyroidotomy so in cricothyroidotomy where is the incision you do you do the incision to the cricothyroid membrane okay so where do you do the incision you do the incision to your cricothyroid membrane so where is your cricothyroid membrane first of all you have to locate where is your cricoid all of you see here this is your cricoid this is your cricoid and above is your thyroid and you see there is a membrane between both of them there you make an incision and put the tube inside okay so this procedure is called as your what this is called as crico thyroidotomy crico thyroido to me crico thyroido to me okay so whenever the intubation fails you give an incision at the level of crico thyroid membrane and then this will work the patient work with the patient okay now let us discuss about what are the list of intrinsic muscles and by the way in the larynx you have got intrinsic muscles you have got extrinsic muscles now intrinsic muscles are very very important and most of the time they are asked what is the function of intrinsic muscles is that they either open the glottis or they close the glottis okay so what are the intrinsic muscles intrinsic muscles of the larynx so what are the intrinsic muscles of the larynx over here now if you can look at this particular picture over here from the side see this particular the first important structure which i am about to mention is called as airy epiglottic muscle what is this muscle this muscle is called as airy epiglottic muscle okay this is your airy epiglottic muscle just beneath the airy epiglottic muscle you have got an oblique arytenoid muscle this one is your oblique arytenoid muscle arytenoid muscle oblique arytenoid muscle beneath the oblique arytenoid muscle you have got transverse arytenoid muscle you look at the fibers also one are some are oblique some are transverse so transverse arytenoid muscle okay and after that you have got a muscle that is located between the thyroid and the arytenoid that is called as thyroarytenoid muscle thyroarytenoid muscle okay and the last here there are last two important muscles here one is called as lateral cricoarytenoid another one is posterior cricoarytenoid posterior is which is on the back so this will be your posterior cricoarytenoid posterior crico arytenoid muscle and this one is called as your lateral cricoarytenoid this is your lateral cricoarytenoid lateral cricoarytenoid muscle so there are two important muscles over here what are these muscles so posterior cricoarytenoid another one is lateral cricoarytenoid so you have got the airy epiglottic muscle oblique arytenoid transverse thyroarytenoid and the remaining structures okay now this is from the lateral view so we can also look at some other muscles right from the posterior view or the same muscles from the posterior view so we can look at the same as well as the muscles which are different on the posterior view okay so in the posterior view it will be very clear to find out how are the oblique muscles located how are the transverse muscles located now here in this particular segment you see that there are some muscles which are transverse here right and there are some muscles which are oblique here. so muscles which are transverse are called as transverse arytenoids yes or no transverse arytenoid muscles which are oblique are called as oblique arytenoid so where are these transverse and oblique arytenoid see this muscle over here is your transverse arytenoid so this is your transverse arytenoid muscle and where is the oblique arytenoid see this one is your oblique arytenoid muscle so this is your oblique arytenoid muscle okay after oblique arytenoid and transverse arytenoid there are next muscles just above here here you see this muscle is called as thyroarytenoid because this lies between thyroid and arytenoid thyro arytenoid thyro arytenoid muscle okay the next important muscle is airy epiglottic muscle so the next muscle over here is your airy 
epiglottic muscle airy epiglottic muscle okay so the last muscle down over here is posterior cricoarytenoid muscle anterior you can look at only from the anterior view and the lateral view right so posterior crico arytenoid muscle now guys to look at the names of these muscles if you clearly observe from where this is originating and where it is inserting then you can very clearly figure out what will be the name of the muscle for example if i tell you a uh, cricoarytenoid so this muscle attaches to both arytenoid as well as the cricoid okay in the same way the remaining thyroarytenoid both the thyroid as well as the cricoid now thyroid as well as the arytenoid now the next important thing which you need to know is that let us look at the functions of these muscles okay so knowing i mean locating the muscle is very important uh, this can be an image based question but knowing the functions is also extremely important so first function which we shall start discussing over here is with the posterior cricoarytenoid okay so let us discuss about the actions of the posterior cricoarytenoid very simple action right posterior cricoarytenoid opens the glottis when i tell opening that will be abduction or adduction it will be abduction of vocal cords so this would perform abduction of your vocal cords so abduction of your vocal cords is called what opening the glottis right so this would lead to this opens the glottis this opens your what glottis okay next important thing remember the mnemonic lot ct you need to do a lot of ct scan right lots of ct scan l stands for what l stands for which muscle that is lateral cricoarytenoid muscle lateral cricoarytenoid muscle o stands for oblique arytenoid oblique arytenoid muscle o stands for oblique arytenoid muscle t stands for transverse arytenoid t stands for transverse arytenoid muscle c stands for cricothyroid cricothyroid muscle and finally t stands for thyroarytenoid muscle T stands for thyroarytenoid muscle. Now, out of all these, I am telling you the posterior cricoarytenoid causes the abduction of vocal cords. Whereas the remaining, these remaining muscles, what do they do? These remaining muscles they cause adduction of the vocal cords, which closes the glottis. I was telling you that laryngeal muscles here have got two actions. The intrinsic muscles, one is uh, they close the glottis, they open the glottis, right? So they close the glottis is adduction, they open the glottis is abduction. So here there is adduction. adduction of the glottis so when i tell adduction of the glottis that will close the glottis they closes the glottis it closes the glottis closes the glottis right now there are two important mcqs that have been asked previously what are these two important questions are which is the muscle that heightens the pitch of the voice and which is the muscle that lowers the pitch of the voice so there are two, two important muscles so one muscle one muscle that heightens one muscle that heightens the pitch of the voice one muscle that heightens the pitch of the voice and that is your cricothyroid muscle what is that your cricothyroid muscle okay now another muscle that lowers the pitch of the voice the muscle that lowers the pitch of the voice lowers the pitch of the voice and what would be that muscle that is called as your thyroarytenoid muscle that will be your thyroarytenoid muscle thyroarytenoid muscle okay two important muscles one is called as cricoarytenoid cricothyroid another one is thyroarytenoid now if you look at the innervation what is the nerve that is innervating innervation of these muscles okay so very very important is regarding the innervation there are only two nerves which innervate these muscles one is recurrent laryngeal nerve another one is superior laryngeal nerve these are the branches of vagus nerve right so one is recurrent laryngeal nerve another one is superior laryngeal nerve 
one is a recurrent laryngeal nerve another one is superior laryngeal nerve now when i tell recurrent laryngeal nerve it has got i mean there are motor branches there are sensory branches also so when i tell the recurrent laryngeal nerve recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies to all the intrinsic muscles except cricothyroid then who is supplying this cricothyroid that is a superior laryngeal nerve okay so recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies to all the intrinsic muscles all intrinsic muscles except your cricothyroid except your cricothyroid muscle then who is supplying this cricothyroid muscle your superior laryngeal supplies your cricothyroid only cricothyroid yes only cricothyroid okay now next important thing so this would be the motor now when it comes to the sensory sensory branches they supply above below the vocal cords in case of recurrent laryngeal and the superior laryngeal is above the vocal cords so this would be below vocal cords below vocal cords and this would be above vocal cords above vocal cords okay but anyways uh, motor is very very important to know okay and remember one thing that uh, this would be taught anyways in the surgery but this important thing is that this recurrent laryngeal nerve passes very close to the thyroid gland so whenever you are doing any kind of thyroid surgery recurrent laryngeal nerve might be damaged okay okay so there are two recurrent laryngeal nerves one on the right one on the left if only one recurrent laryngeal nerve is damaged that would lead to hoarseness of voice but if both the recurrent laryngeal nerves are damaged what will happen then all your intrinsic muscles are gone if all your intrinsic muscles are gone what will happen the vocal cords will collapse that is a medical emergency and immediately what you need to do to secure the airways you need to do tracheostomy okay this is one of the very important thing you need to know so let me write it down that what did i tell you recurrent laryngeal nerve passes clear, uh, close to recurrent laryngeal nerve passes close to the thyroid gland okay now in case of thyroid surgery what will happen this recurrent laryngeal nerve might be damaged so in case of thyroid surgery two important things can happen right so there might be chances that there can be unilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury or there can be bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury so what will happen if there is a unilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury that would lead to hoarseness of voice that would lead to hoarseness of voice hoarseness of voice if there is bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury what would happen that is a medical emergency that is a medical emergency and you have to what you have to immediately secure the airways no to secure the airways what do you need to do you need to do tracheostomy tracheotomy okay what do you need to do you need to do tracheotomy to secure the airways okay so these are some of the important things which you need to know regarding the larynx here just a quick review of this so we started our discussion with this particular picture over here from the anterior surface of the neck right in the anterior surface of the larynx over here you have got the thyrohyoid membrane over here cricothyroid membrane right thyroid cartilage is a single cartilage cricoid is also single cartilage epiglottis is also single cartilage now next important thing um, we divide the entire um, the the larynx into three compartments right supraglottic space glottic or laryngeal ventricle and infraglottic space or subglottic space so here this is subglottic space laryngeal ventricle and supraglottic space okay so cartilage is two unpaid and paid unpaid are c t c e t c stands for cricoid e stands for epiglottis t stands for thyroid and paid cartilages are arytenoid corniculate and cuneiform cartilages so here you can look at the picture of cartilages and very important thing you see an aperture on the membrane over here so this particular aperture is having superior laryngeal artery and superior laryngeal nerve they can point at the aperture and ask what artery and nerve passes through this okay so cricothyroidotomy in case of any kind of emergency you need to do this cricothyroidotomy okay and these are the muscles here and posterior cricoarytenoid close opens the glottis opening in the sense abduction closing in the sense adduction done by lot ct that is lateral cricoarytenoid obliquarytenoid transverse arytenoid cricothyroid and thyroarytenoid 
okay and again this is very important thing the muscle that increases or heightens the pitch of the voice that is cricothyroid muscle which lowers the pitch of the voice that is thyroarachnoid muscle okay right so these are the nerve injuries over here okay uh, so now we shall be discussing another important topic that is called as a fascia of the neck that is called fascia of neck so whenever you look at the fascia of the neck there are two important fascia which you come across here one is called as i mean regarding the fascia of the neck neck in the sense what the cervical region right so it means we are actually discussing about the cervical fascia two important fascia one is called as superficial cervical fascia and the other one is called as a deep cervical fascia okay so what are these two important fascia one fascia is called as superficial cervical fascia another one is called as a deep cervical fascia so superficial as well as the deep cervical fascia these are the two important things now where is this superficial cervical fascia present this is present between the skin and the deep cervical fascia you have got the skin you have got the deep cervical fascia in between both of them you have got the superficial cervical fascia so that is located between skin and deep cervical fascia that is located between the skin and the deep cervical fascia now if you look another important thing also you can come across here that so this particular superficial cervical fascia surrounds what what are the structures that does it surround so this superficial cervical fascia surrounds structures called as psp PSP. What does P stands for? P stands for your platysma muscle. P stands for your platysma muscle. S stands for subcutaneous fat tissue. Subcutaneous fat tissue. S stands for subcutaneous fat tissue and P stands for. So it surrounds what? It surrounds just remember a mnemonic called as PSS. So it surrounds the structures which are PSS. P stands for platysma muscle. P stands for platysma muscle. Second important thing, S stands for subcutaneous fat tissue. Subcutaneous fat tissue. And the third important thing, S stands for superficial nerves, veins and lymph nodes. Superficial nerves veins as well as the lymph nodes these are the three important structures that that it is having here right now next important thing is that if you look at this picture in this picture you can see the deep cervical fascia okay now coming to this deep cervical fascia there are three important layers which you can see over here one is called as the investing layer another one is called as a pretracheal layer and the last one is called as a prevertebral layer Okay, and finally we have got something called as carotid sheath. Now this green color layer which you can see over here is called as the investing layer. The yellow color one is called as the prevertebral layer and the remaining the red one wherever it is it is called as a prevertebral layer. The yellow one is called as a pretracheal because it is located in front of the trachea and the this particular pinkish layer which you can see is called as a carotid sheath. You see this particular layer which I will be drawing right now right you see this layer this layer is called as your carotid sheath on either sides you have got this carotid sheath like this okay and the yellow color layer yellow color layer here this particular layer here you see this particular layer like this this is called as your pretracheal and the remaining all you have got is the investing layer so first of all what we will do is that we will locate the muscles within this and later on we shall look at each and every layer and what structures specifically it is surrounding first of all let us uh, locate the muscles within this okay so here the first muscle which you come across this one is called as your trapezius muscle so this muscle over here is called as your trapezius muscle now apart from trapezius see this muscle over here is called as your anterior scalene muscle this is your anterior scalene now when i tell anterior scalene there will be middle scalene and posterior scalene so this one over here is called as middle scalene 
middle scalene and this one over here is called as your posterior scalene so anterior scalene middle scalene and posterior scalene you have got now apart from this there is another muscle that is located just in front of the trapezius on the back you have got trapezius in front of the trapezius what do you have this particular muscle is called as your levator scapulae muscle levator scapulae muscle levator scapulae muscle okay now on the back side you have got splenius muscles so here i can show you two splenius muscles over here one is called as semispinalis capitus you see on the back side here i can show you uh, two spinal muscles see this particular this particular spinal muscle over here is called as semispinalis capitus this is semi spinalis capitus this is one particular muscle and the next muscle is splenius capitus so this particular muscle over here he is your splenius capitus muscle two important muscles one is called has your levator scapulae splenius capitus and semi spinalis capitus muscle okay so these are some of the muscles which you can see here on the near the vertebral body okay now apart from this here there are some more important structures so what are these important structures i'll put the numbers and i will explain you see this is one these two are one and the center i'm putting it as two over here this yellow color area is two right and this part as three this part as three behind the two i am treating it as three and this is four and this is five and remember one thing just in between four and five you have got a small structure like this this one is called as your vagus nerve what is this this is called as your vagus nerve and where is this four five and vagus nerve present they are enclosed in a pink color sheath this pink color sheath is called as carotid sheath so can i tell vagus nerve one of the content of carotid sheath is vagus nerve right so one of the content of vagus uh, carotid sheath is your vagus nerve next these muscles in the front here these muscles in the front these are called as infrahyoid muscles infrahyoid muscles what are these muscles these are infrahyoid muscles now what is this particular muscle over here you see this particular muscle here this particular muscle over here is called as your sternocleidomastoid muscle sternocleidomastoid muscle what is this this is your sternocleidomastoid muscle so overall infrahyoid sternocleidomastoid vagus anterior scalene middle scalene posterior scalene and trapezius we have discussed levator scapulus splenius capitus and semi spinalis capitus these are the things we have discussed now let us uh, write down the numbers here how many numbers are there completely we have got five important numbers right so let us write it down 1 2 3 4 5 and five. so what is the first one over here on either side the first one we have got is a thyroid gland so this is your thyroid gland this is your thyroid gland on either side now after that what is the number 2 here number 2 is called as your trachea number 2 over here is called as your trachea now behind the trachea what do you have number 3 that is your esophagus that is your esophagus esophagus behind that what do you have you have got what, what is number 4 here number 4 is your common carotid artery number 5 is your vein what is that internal jugular vein when we are discussing the triangles itself uh, there in the carotid triangle i have told you i think carotid triangle i have told you there is an artery there is a vein there is a nerve artery is called as common carotid artery and here the vein is called internal jugular vein as well as the nerve is called as vagus nerve so 4 and 5 one is called as common carotid artery another one is internal jugular vein these are the structures here okay so now after writing down these structures we shall discuss about each and every layer like we will discuss investing layer first what are the structures does this investing layer is surrounding right and pretracheal layer and vertebral layer okay first let us start with the investing layer investing layer now if you look at the investing layer so let us look investing layer surrounds what structures investing layer surrounds which structures over here so where is this investing layer you see all this green color thing here you can also see some green color lines here you can also see green color lines down here so it means can i tell the investing layer is the largest one 
right so investing layer is surrounding your sternocleidomastoid and trapezius if you very clearly see you can understand here so for that understanding i have to rub this part okay i'm rubbing this part here now you can see what is this particular muscle what is this particular muscle this is your sternocleidomastoid now back here what is this particular muscle this is your trapezius so in the front sternocleidomastoid and anteriorly do you see that it is enveloping any other thing no it is like a thin line like this you see it is like a thin line and again when you come onto the right sternocleidomastoid and onto the back here trapezius okay and then on the back posteriorly is it no posteriorly it is also not enveloping anything so only two important things that it is surrounding what is the first important thing that is your sternocleidomastoid muscle and the second muscle is your trapezius muscle sternocleidomastoid muscle as well as your trapezius muscle okay so where is its position the position is directly under the platysma muscle position is directly under under platysma position is directly under the platysma okay now sir where is platysma now look here see this particular muscle over here which you can see right so this particular muscle which you can see over here this is your platysma you see this is your platysma like this all the way it is present here right you see till here this particular muscle which you can see is called as your platysma muscle okay right after the investing layer the next important thing we have to discuss is the carotid sheath carotid sheath so what are the structures that are present beneath this carotid sheath so that's what i was telling you carotid sheath surrounds carotid sheath surrounds what structures here carotid sheath surrounds four important structures so one two three four what are those four important structures one is called as common carotid artery and there is also internal carotid artery which is not shown in the picture right there is also internal jugular vein as well as the vagus nerve these are the four important structures that are surrounded by your carotid sheath next important layer over here is called as a pre tracheal layer the next important layer is what pre tracheal layer and this particular pre tracheal layer surrounds what structures pre tracheal layer surrounds four important structures first of all where is this pre tracheal layer see this one this yellow color layer this yellow color layer over here is your pre tracheal layer okay so yellow color layer pre tracheal layer first of all it is surrounding a group of muscles called as infrahyoid muscles after that in the center what it is surrounding it is surrounding your thyroid gland number 1 number 2 is your trachea number 3 is your esophagus these are the three important things right so your pre tracheal layer surrounds structures what are the structures first it is surrounding infra hyoid muscles okay next it is surrounding your esophagus it is surrounding your esophagus next it is surrounding your trachea esophagus trachea and then it is surrounding your thyroid gland thyroid gland so infrahyoid muscles esophagus trachea as well as your in, uh, as well as your thyroid gland now coming to the prevertebral layer where is your prevertebral layer the layer that is highlighted with the red okay so this particular layer you see this particular layer is your prevertebral layer so let us see what structures are present within this prevertebral layer simple thing deep muscles of neck okay like your splenius muscles and semispinalis muscles next you have got your levator scapulae muscle that is also located within this okay coming to the vasculature i will just uh, write it down it is not given in the picture so the next layer which i told you what was that prevertebral layer prevertebral layer now coming to the prevertebral layer first of all let us see what does these structures this layer surrounds what structures does this layer surround deep muscles of neck and levator scapulae muscle deep muscles of neck and levator scapulae muscles deep muscles of neck and levator scapulae muscles coming to the vasculature 
coming to the vasculature what are the structures that it is surrounding sympathetic trunk one is your sympathetic trunk and the second one is your phrenic nerve phrenic nerve and the third important one is your uh, uh, subclavian artery subclavian artery fourth important one is your brachial plexus brachial plexus so these are the four important structures which it is surrounding okay so these are the discussion this is the discussion that we have done regarding the fascia of the neck so once again we discuss regarding the fascia of the neck that there are two fascia superficial cervical as well as deep superficial is located between the skin and the deep cervical fascia now it surrounds what platysma subcutaneous fat and superficial nerves arteries and veins okay here you cannot see the superficial cervical fascia what you can see is a deep deep is having what pip what is this pip p stands for pretracheal i stands for investing p stands for prevertebral layer so let us look at the structures here investing layer surrounds sternocleidomastoid and trapezius in the front sternocleidomastoid on the back trapezius position is under the platysma i have shown you in the picture uh, carotid sheath common carotid artery internal carotid artery uh, internal jugular vein and vagus nerve these are the four important structures pretracheal layer surrounds what infrahyoid muscle esophagus trachea and thyroid gland prevertebral layer that is a deep muscles of the neck uh, levator scapulae next we have got the sympathetic trunk phrenic nerve subclavian artery as well as the brachial plexus okay so these are the structures here now coming to the next most important thing that is the course of the mandibular nerve mandibular nerve so before we discuss the branches of the mandibular nerve first of all what we'll do is that we shall just uh, draw the mandible okay and its foramen and then we shall discuss about it so in the mandible here you have got an opening called as mandibular foramen and here you have got an opening called as mental foramen right now when it comes to the mandibular nerve right so all of you know uh, we have got three divisions of what three divisions of right we have got the three important divisions right so out of which the mandibular nerve is the third one which passes through foramen ovale all of you know that right so let us let us write down that this particular foramen is foramen ovale right so now through this foramen first what is happening is that this particular mandibular nerve passes through this foramen ovale okay now the moment it comes out of the foramen ovale it is going to give one branch to the medial pterygoid muscle so to which muscle it is giving the branch one is your medial pterygoid muscle it is giving a branch to the medial pterygoid muscle now not only that the same branch gives one more branch over here that branch is given to the tensor tympani and tensor veli palatini one is tensor veli palatini another one is tensor tympani there are two important structures okay next this particular mandibular nerve is dividing into two important portions one is called as the anterior division another one is called as a posterior division okay now when it comes to the anterior division now this particular anterior division is giving out some branches so what are the branches it is giving anterior division gives rise to the buccal nerve and next it is also giving muscle, giving nerve supply to the muscles of mastication so two important structures one is called as muscles of mastication muscles of mastication another one is called as buccal nerve now next important division is posterior division this posterior division gives out a branch and this branch is called as auriculotemporal nerve auriculo temporal nerve apart from this it is also giving another branch here this branch is called as your lingual nerve it gives another branch called as lingual nerve and after that after that it gives another branch this branch passes through what it branch passes through this mandibular foramen and this is called as inferior alveolar nerve what is the name of the nerve this is your inferior alveolar nerve okay now this inferior alveolar nerve passes along this mandibular canal and comes out of a special nerve called as mental nerve comes out as a mental nerve comes out as a mental nerve 
and next important thing is that it also gives supply to a muscle called as mylohyoid and anterior belly of digastric mylohyoid and anterior belly of digastric muscle mylohyoid and anterior belly of digastric muscle so these are some of the branches which you need to know regarding the mandibular nerve okay right so now guys let us discuss about the branches of external carotid artery mostly they are going to ask you the image based questions from this okay so what are the branches of this external carotid artery so this picture will help you to remember so for example let me put up this thing so this particular picture somewhat it will help you to remember the branches naming the branches easily okay so let us look at this particular picture over here so this is an external carotid artery and all of you should understand this very important thing that if this is a heart all of you know that coming out of your coming out of your uh, left ventricle you have got an iota right so this is an iota this is an arch of iota and next you have got an artery that is descending down this is called as a descending iota and next important thing uh, regarding this descending iota is that on the right side over here you have got a trunk that is called as your brachiocephalic trunk this brachiocephalic trunk divides into subclavian and common carotid artery so what is this this is your common carotid artery this common carotid artery divides into two one is called as external carotid another one is called as internal carotid what is this external carotid artery and internal carotid artery okay so now we shall be discussing the branches of your external carotid artery so regarding this external carotid artery now this particular thing is a picture that is called as digital subtraction angiography what is this dsa dsa digital subtraction angiography so in this digital subtraction angiography or dsa angiography what are the branches see the first important thing is that this external carotid artery right first important thing is that this external carotid artery that goes up all the way like this right and where it is going look in relation with the picture which i have drawn look where it is going it is going all the way up into your temporal region this artery is going all the way up into the temporal region so this artery number 8 which is going to the temporal region is called as superficial temporal artery okay so what is the name of this artery the name of this artery number 8 artery number 8 is called as superficial temporal artery superficial temporal artery okay now after this superficial temporal artery look here another important artery you see an artery that is going up like this you see an artery that is going up and that is going back like this this is artery number 5 right so just concentrate on that artery number 5 you see this artery is going on back to the occipital side so can i tell that this artery number 5 is occipital artery because it is going on to the back right so artery number 5 over here would be your occipital artery occipital artery okay now after this occipital artery there is one more artery here what is this another artery you see artery number 3 this artery number 3 is entering into the face once it enters into the face it is giving three branches just follow this this is artery number 3 so it is giving one branch all the way to the eye it is giving one branch to the nose and the lips it is giving another branch to another lip okay so it is giving branches in this way so what are these branches the branch which is going to the eye that is called as medial angular artery which means you see it supplies to the medial surface of the eye this is called as a medial angular artery next it is supplying to the nose this is called as lateral nasal artery from here it will supply to the nose from here it will supply to the nose that is why it is called lateral nasal artery third important thing it is supplying to the upper lip called as superior labial artery next it is supplying down to the lower lip called as inferior labial artery okay so i am rubbing it out now just look here I'll look at the branches now so this is a third artery you see how this third artery is going like this see this is your inferior labial and this is your superior labial uh, as well as 
artery to the nose, lateral nasal, and this is to the eye. Okay, so these are the branches here. <coughs> so, but anyways, you need not to know these branches in detail. What you need to know is what is artery number three. This artery number three is your facial artery. Artery number three is your facial artery. Okay. Now, if artery number three is your facial artery, where is your tongue present? This is the location of your tongue. Now, to this tongue, you see a branch that is going into the tongue like this. Again, once again, you see this branch that is entering into the tongue, right? So, what is this? Branch number two. So, that is called as your lingual artery. Branch number two is called as your lingual artery. Branch number two is called as your lingual artery, right? The next important thing is, you see this branch number nine. So, this branch number nine over here is supplying to the maxilla. So, all of you know that this is your maxilla like this. So, it is supplying to the maxilla. So, branch number 9 is called as maxillary artery. Maxillary artery. Branch number 9 is called as maxillary artery. Okay. Now, let us look at another branch. Right. So, if you see here, if you see here carefully that you have got one branch. See, where is this? Let us say that this is the ear. This is the ear. Now, there is a branch like this, you see branch number 7 that is passing just behind the ear. So, can I call it as posterior, behind the ear is auricular artery. Branch number 7 is called as your posterior auricular artery. Branch number 7 is your posterior auricular artery, right? So, branch number 7 is posterior auricular artery. Now, let us, we are left over with branch number 4 as well as branch number 6. Now, this branch number 4, look at this branch number 4. This branch number 4, the course is completely not in detail here. Just remember that this branch number 4 is pharyngo-occipital trunk. And branch number 6, it is ascending up actually, you see. But this is also very light and thin, you can't see it here. Just remember that this branch number 6 is your ascending pharyngeal artery. Okay, one is your branch number 7. Uh, branch number 4 is your pharyngo occipital right this is your pharyngo occipital trunk pharyngo occipital trunk and the branch number 6 is your ascending pharyngeal artery ascending pharyngeal artery ascending pharyngeal artery now you can't see branch number 1 over here but remember that here you have got your thyroid gland Okay, so there is a branch that supplies all the way onto the top of your thyroid gland. So, if a branch is supplying onto the top of the thyroid gland, you call it a superior thyroid artery. Okay, so that would be your branch number one, that would be your superior thyroid artery. So, these are the branches which you can identify it on a digital subtraction angiography, which is very, 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 very important. Okay. Digital subtraction angiography. Now, if you want to remember the mnemonic, it is very easy to remember the mnemonic. Remember it as flop mass. Okay. Remember it as F L O P flop mass. M, where is M? This is M. This is A, S, and S. Okay. Flop mass. Just remember it as flop mass. This gives you the branches of external carotid artery. Okay. This gives you the branches of external carotid artery. Now, in this way, if you wanted to look at the branches, let us see how are the branches here, okay. Now, if you can see here, this is your common carotid artery. Common carotid artery will divide into external carotid and internal carotid. Now, out of these, which is external carotid, see this one, this branch over here is your external carotid artery and this, you see internal carotid, this branch over here which is going up is called as your internal carotid artery, right. So, if they ask you in this way, how do you answer? So, first of all, whatever branch that is supplying here is called as external carotid, okay. So, which means this particular branch is your external carotid artery and this particular short branch is called as internal carotid artery over here. Now, let us tell me, uh, let us discuss the branches which you know based upon the location. Like for example, one branch going on to the occipital region. So, I can call it as occipital artery, yes or no? which is going to the occipital region is occipital artery. For example, if I am drawing an ear over here, this is the ear. What did I tell you? Any branch going behind the ear is called posterior auricular artery. See, this one is your 
posterior auricular artery okay next important thing there is another branch going on to the top supplying your temporal region here what artery is this superficial temporal artery this is your superficial temporal artery this is your superficial temporal artery so occipital artery superficial temporal artery posterior auricular external and internal carotid next important thing any artery going into your face directly that is your this one this is your facial artery this is your facial artery next an artery that is exactly going to the maxilla where is that see this is the artery that is exactly going into the maxilla so this artery over here is called as your maxillary artery this is your maxillary artery over here okay this is your maxillary artery next important thing is that you can see a small artery here this one this particular artery this one this small artery here this is called as your ascending pharyngeal artery this is called as your ascending pharyngeal artery what is this this is your ascending pharyngeal artery and still what arteries are we left over with so we are left over with another artery which supplies down see external carotid is going up like this it gives one branch that goes down and supplies to the top of your thyroid so which is a branch that is going down here so this is a branch that is going down and this branch over here is called as your superior thyroid artery superior thyroid artery okay and the top one here just you need to remember it as a memory part this is your lingual artery so these are the branches of your external carotid artery over here okay so now we shall be discussing the topic of circle of willis okay so circle of willis is also called as a willis circle okay now here a uh, very important thing you need to understand that the blood supply to the brain is mainly done by two important vessels okay so what are those two important vessels one is called what are the two important vessels that supply the blood to the brain so one is called as the vertebro basilar system vertebro basilar system and the other one is called as internal carotid system so there are two important systems one is called as a vertebro basilar system and the other one is called as a internal carotid system so first here we shall discuss in this picture later on in detail we shall discuss in this picture okay so first of all if you look at this particular picture over here what are the important things which you can see so this artery which you can see over here down this is called as your basilar artery so next important thing is how is that basilar artery form the two vertebral arteries so vertebral artery from the right vertebral artery from the left both of them they join together to form basilar artery that is why i am telling you it is a vertebro basilar system so two arteries join together to form the uh, basilar artery now this you cannot see the basilar artery here anyways but uh, this particular part over here is called as your basilar artery i am writing it as ba basilar artery now this basilar artery is dividing into two branches right you see there are two branches of pca pca stands for posterior cerebral artery okay so here this is dividing into two important branches so this branch is called as posterior cerebral artery here right so this is also your posterior cerebral artery okay now next important thing is that uh, if you if you look at other branches see this particular branch over here is called as your internal carotid artery okay now from this internal carotid artery you see two more branches horizontally going this is called as middle cerebral artery okay here also you have got middle cerebral artery now in the front here you have got this artery this is called as anterior cerebral artery one on the right one on the left okay now in between the two anterior cerebral artery you see a small stem like this right so this small part which you can see in the center like this this is called as anterior communicating artery what is this anterior communicating artery next important branch which you can see here connecting this one you see here this particular branch is called as posterior communicating artery you have got here is a posterior communicating artery so what are the important arteries over here you can see the posterior cerebral artery right you can see the middle cerebral artery you can see the anterior cerebral artery 
But if you see the circle of villis, within the circle of villis, which artery is not participating in the circle of villis, that is your middle cerebral artery, do not participate in the formation of circle of villis. So here also you can see these branches over here. Here in detail you can see. Okay. So if you look at the posterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery is divided into two branches. One is called as the P1 segment, another one is called as a P2 segment. In the same way, if you look at anterior cerebral artery, that is also divided into two segments, A1 segment as well as the A2 segment. Okay. So, this part is called as your circle of villis. Coming on to the next important thing over here. Now, here the arterial system is pretty much clear, right. So, what is uh, this particular artery over here? So, this is your vertebral artery and on the other side also you have got the vertebral artery, right. So, you see this particular artery over here is this particular artery over here is called as your vertebral artery. This one is also your vertebral artery. Now from both of these vertebral arteries together, these vertebral arteries together they join and form this particular artery you see this is called as your basilar artery. What is this? This is your basilar artery. Okay. Next important thing is that now from the basilar artery two more branches are coming. You see this is branch number one and this is branch number two. So, the branch which is on the top is called as superior cerebellar artery, right? So, this is called as superior cerebellar artery and branch number 2 is called as anterior inferior cerebellar artery, okay? Why it is called as anterior inferior cerebellar, why it is called as anterior? Because it is present on the anterior side. If there is, if it is anterior, then there should be another branch which is posterior. So, branch number 3 is posterior inferior cerebellar artery, right? Now, easy way to remember this is that, for example, where is this blood supply present? This blood supply is present to the base of the brain, right? So, this is the brain, right? Now, you have removed the skull cap. You can see the brain. Now, I have lifted the brain. When I lift the brain, this part, down part is called as the base of the brain. Now, I have, what I have done is that, I have just shown it up to you in this way right so the base of the brain i have lifted it up now you can see the base of the brain now in this base of the brain this part is called as anterior this part is called as a posterior so here it is an anterior cerebellar artery posterior cerebellar artery but both of them are present on the inferior surface so you call it as anterior inferior cerebellar artery another one is posterior inferior cerebellar artery okay now these two arteries are done after that, the next artery, the basilar artery finally terminates into two arteries. This is called posterior cerebral artery on the right as well as on the left. Okay. Next important thing, where is your internal carotid artery? See, this artery over here is your internal carotid artery. Internal carotid artery is giving a branch. And what is that branch? That is your middle cerebral artery. It is also giving another branch. What is that? This is called anterior cerebral artery. It is giving a third branch that is this one that is called as posterior communicating artery. So, internal carotid artery gives three branches anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery and posterior communicating artery. Connecting both the anterior cerebral arteries you have got this called as anterior communicating artery, anterior communicating artery. So, this forms your circle of villus. Now, here your middle cerebral artery is not taking part in the formation of circle of villus. So, this is one of the very important thing which you need to know. Okay. So, all of you know that here we have got this particular cranial fossa which you can see over here, right. So, this is your anterior, let me use red, this is your anterior cranial fossa. And here we have got the middle cranial fossa and this is a posterior cranial fossa. Okay. Now, import, what is important, I will tell you, but as a rule, let me discuss the borders also, okay. So, this uh, part which I have highlighted with uh, the pink, right, now which I am highlighting with the green, this part is called as your anterior cranial fossa. This is your anterior cranial fossa. Anterior cranial fossa is having three important borders over here. See, anteriorly and laterally, we have got a bone, posteriorly and medially and posteriorly and laterally. What do you mean by that? anteriorly in the sense anteriorly laterally in the sense see this is lateral border okay so anterior laterally i can also call it as anterior laterally anterior laterally what do i have i have got the inner surface of the frontal bone all of you know that this bone is a frontal bone if this is a frontal bone this is the inner surface right this is the inner surface of the frontal bone 
so and anteriorly i have got frontal bone and laterally what do i have i have got the inner surface of the frontal bone so anterior laterally i have got the inner surface of the frontal bone next posterior medially posterior posterior in the sense this entire thing over here is your posterior border in that there are two important things the center is the medial part two bumpy elevations here we have got these are the lateral part so that is why you can call it as posterior medially and posterior laterally posterior medially what do i have got i have got this particular part like this this is called as the limbus of your sphenoid bone what is this limbus of your sphenoid bone and posterior laterally what is this posterior laterally i have got wings right so these are called as the lesser wings of the sphenoid bone so these are the three important things you need to understand now moving on to the second important thing here this is the lateral view and this is from the superior view from the top right now from the top if you see in the anterior cranial fossa how many bones do we have so far we discussed the borders now we will discuss the bones how many bones are comprising within this anterior cranial fossa first of all where is this anterior cranial fossa see here this border which i am drawing right now this is your anterior cranial fossa okay it is having three bones see this blue color bone is called as your frontal bone in the center the bone which is in the violet is called as your ethmoid bone and next this yellow color bone here is called as your sphenoid bone so this part which you can see over here right till here this part is called as your this part is called as your anterior cranial fossa three bones blue violet and yellow blue is your frontal bone and this violet is your ethmoid bone and finally the yellow color part is your sphenoid bone sphenoid bone now if you look at that blue color one what is this blue color one i told you this blue color one is your frontal bone this blue color one is your frontal bone now if you see in the anterior most part of the frontal bone here you see a crest like thing right a bony ridge like thing you saw no a bony ridge and irregularity you see this bony ridge like thing is nothing but called as frontal crest or you can also call it as what is this bony ridge like thing repeat so this bony ridge like thing is called as frontal crest why do we need this frontal where is this frontal crest located in the frontal bone anterior most part right can you show it in another picture yes so all of you just look here where is the frontal crest you see this part is your frontal crest okay right why frontal crest is needed for us why frontal crest is needed is that this is the place where flax cerebra is attached now what do you mean by this particular now what do you mean by this flax cerebra what do you mean by this flax cerebra is that look here this is one cerebral hemisphere this is another cerebral hemisphere surrounding that you have got a dura mater arachnoid mater and pia mater now what i am telling you is that this blue color thing which i have drawn here this is nothing but called as your dura mater so what is dura mater happening what is dura mater doing here dura mater is separating the two cerebral hemispheres dura mater is enfolding itself it is folding in between the two halves of the cerebral hemisphere this enfolding of dura mater is nothing but called as your flax cerebra so what is it written fold of dura mater that is separating the right and left cerebral hemisphere is called as your flax cerebra now where is this flax cerebra attached this flax cerebra is attached exactly at this point right what is this point this point is your frontal crest where your flax cerebra is attached so where is flax cerebra present flax cerebra is attached to the frontal crest where is frontal crest present that is present in the anterior cranial fossa okay now much more clearly if you want to see you can look at this particular picture now in this picture you know this half will be one cerebral hemisphere on the other side there will be another cerebral hemisphere you see this green color mat this green color mat which is separating both the cerebral hemispheres this is what is called as your flax cerebra now if you look at the real cadaveric image here it is very clear to you you see that i have pointed arrows also over here you see these arrows that are separating here now all of you can see that this is the dura mater here you see here dura mater is entering inside like this and separating the two cerebral hemispheres and if you clearly if i zoom in here you can see that this is a fold of dura mater and this fold of dura mater you see where it is attached the point where i have completely made a circle here that is a 
bony crest where it is attached. So you see this fold of dura mater is separating the right cerebral hemisphere from the left cerebral hemisphere yes or no? What is that called as? That is called as your flax cerebri. Now in the anterior cranial fossa as I told you three bones are present frontal, ethmoid and sphenoid. Let us discuss about each and everything. First let us in the anterior cranial fossa what is this bone in the center here? What is this bone in the center? I just told you what was that? That is called as your cribriform plate, right? So all of you just look here. In this part, frontal bone, ethmoid bone and sphenoid bone. Exactly on the surface of ethmoid bone, you have got a plate and that plate is called cribriform plate, okay? You see here where is ethmoid bone? See, this is your ethmoid bone and within this ethmoid bone, you have got a plate here. This plate is called as cribriform plate. Now let us look about this cribriform plate. Now, if you look closely into this cribriform plate over here, what is the important thing you can see? What is the important thing you can see? Important thing which you can see is that within this cribriform, whatever I am discussing, only those things keep in mind, okay? This cribriform plate has got foramina, right? This cribriform plate has got foramina. How are these foramina? Let us look at this. So, this is your cribriform plate. There are multiple foramina. Foramina are in the form of two groups over here, okay? So, there are large foramina here, there are large foramina and there are multiple small foramina. These large foramina here are called as anterior ethmoidal foramina and these small foramina over here are called, repeat. So, this is a cribriform plate which I have taken it. Now, in this cribriform plate, if you see, there are two, four large foramina. See, here there are two foramina, here there are two foramina. Four large foramina are there. So, the two upper two foramina are called as anterior ethmoid foramina. The lower two foramina are called as posterior ethmoid foramina. Next, there are multiple small foramina also. So, multiple, within this multiple small foramina, the nerve that is coming out is olfactory nerve. And what about the anterior ethmoidal and posterior ethmoidal which are large? From the anterior ethmoidal foramina, you have got anterior ethmoidal artery, nerve and vein. From the posterior ethmoidal foramina, you have got posterior ethmoidal artery, nerve and vein. I hope this is clear. So, this is all you need to know regarding the anterior cranial fossa. Okay, anterior cranial fossa. So, this is your anterior cranial fossa over here. Okay, so next important thing is that. Uh, in the entire anterior cranial fossa, the most common part which is very easy to fracture. Most common fracture of anterior cranial fossa out of three bones which we have, the most commonly that is fractured is a cribriform plate. You see this center cribriform plate is a most commonly that will fracture. Why? Because this is the thinnest part. Now when the cribriform plate will fracture, what will happen? All the CSF through these holes will leak into your nose. Okay, exactly in the center here you have cribriform plate, the CSF will leak into the nose. Okay, so this is the thinnest part and the CSF will leak into the nose that is called as CSF rhinorrhea. On the other hand, what can happen? There can also be damage if there is a fracture, all there are multiple small foramina. These multiple small foramina will also be cut off, right? They will also be disrupted. Now within this foramina, what is lodged? That is the olfactory nerve, so an olfactory nerve also will be cut off. This would lead to anosmia. Okay, so this is the clinical point which you need to know. Coming to the middle cranial fossa. So if you are making a section at this level, you come across the middle cranial fossa. Now in this middle cranial fossa, what are the important bones? You see this part which I am drawing it with the green right now, this is called as a sphenoid bone. Next you have got two more bones. You see these two bones on either side, this is called as the squamous part of the temporal bone and just behind that you have got the petrous part of the temporal bone. So how many parts? You have got sphenoid bone and temporal bone, both of them taking part in the formation of your middle cranial fossa. Now out of these two, sphenoid is completely different. Now coming to the temporal, there are two parts. One is called as the squamous part of the temporal bone and the other one is called as the petrous part of the temporal bone. Now let us look at another picture. Now in this picture, what can you see? This yellow color bone in the starting also I told you, yellow color bone is your sphenoid bone. You see this yellow color part which I am highlighting right now, you see this part, this yellow color part which I am highlighting right now is called as your sphenoid bone. Okay, that is called as your sphenoid bone. Next, here you have got another bone, right? What is this? 
temporal bone. Which part of the temporal bone? Squamous part of the temporal bone. Just behind that you have got another bone here. What is this? This is called as a petrous part of the temporal bone. So sphenoid, squamous part of the temporal bone, petrous part of the temporal bone together they form your middle cranial fossa. If you wanted to look at the borders, what are the borders over here? See, the first important thing is this entire border which I am highlighting right now with the green or uh, you want me to highlight with the uh, which color would be better what do you think okay let me choose red so this entire border which I am highlighting here this is the anterior border in this anterior border there are two parts anterior medial and on the either side there is anterior lateral so anterior medial again same things limbus of sphenoid I have Anterior laterally what I have got lesser wings of sphenoid. Now when you come to posterior region we have got only one border here this is this one posterior lateral border and posterior medial border ok. So this entire border is a posterior border where this is where this is the posterior medial and this is your posterior lateral border. Posterior medially what do I have? I have got the dorsum cilia of the sphenoid. This is called as the dorsum cilia of the sphenoid. Posterior laterally, what do I have got? I have got the superior part of the petrous part of temporal bone. You know that this is a petrous part of the temporal bone and this is a squamous part of the temporal bone. So the superior part of the petrous part of the temporal bone forms the posterior lateral component. Now if you look at the foramina that are present, if you look at closely here, this foramina is called the superior orbital fissure. Within the superior orbital fissure, you have got third pair of cranial nerve, fourth pair of cranial nerve, that is the fifth pair of cranial nerve, that is the ophthalmic branch of fifth pair of cranial nerve and the abducens nerve. When it comes to the next foramen, that is foramen rotundum, so within this foramen rotundum, you have got the maxillary branch. When it comes to the foramen ovale, you have got the mandibular branch. And when it comes to foramen spinosum, which is small like a spine, Oval is oval, rotundum is round, you see perfectly round is rotundum, oval is oval, like a spine, small spine, you have got foramen spinosum. Foramen spinosum has got three middles, middle meningeal artery, middle meningeal vein and meningeal branch of V3. Next, we have got another foramen here, this is called as foramen lacerum. Now if you look into the posterior cranial fossa, this is your posterior cranial fossa. Now posterior cranial fossa is having how many borders? So this entirely you have got is an anterior border. In this anterior border again anterior medial this is anterior lateral. Anterior medial what do you have? Something related with the sphenoid that is a dorsum cilia of the sphenoid. Anterior laterally what do you have got? I have got the petrous part of the temporal bone. You see this is a petrous part of the temporal bone here. This is a squamous part of the temporal bone here. Right? So I have got the superior border of the petrous part of the temporal bone. Posteriorly what do I have? This is the occipital bone. What part of the occipital bone? Squamous part of the occipital bone. So there is only single bone here. There is no division like this. If there was a division like this, you would have done that there is a, if, if there is a division in this particular manner, then there should be posterior medial, posterior lateral. But there is no, no such thing. There is only a single division here. That is why you written it as posterior, that is the squamous part of the occipital bone. Okay, right. Now if you look at the foramens over here, here you have got internal acoustic meatus, you have got the jugular foramen, you have got the hypoglossal canal where the hypoglossal nerve will run and finally the largest one is called as a foramen magnum. Okay, so you can see the foramens here very clearly. Now if you look at the foramen magnum, what are the structures the picture is given on the side. First medulla oblongata, right, you see the part of medulla oblongata sliding down. Next meninges obviously surrounding the spinal cord you have got meninges they are also coming down. Next you have got the vertebral artery right I told you this is your right vertebral artery this is your left vertebral artery both of them join together to form the basilar artery. Next important one is spinal accessory nerve you see this green color nerve that is passing this is called as your spinal accessory nerve. Next in the center this pink color one is called as anterior spinal artery on the back side you call it as a posterior spinal artery. Next dural veins, these are the structures that pass through the foramen magnum. When it comes to the jugular foramen, these are the structures like glossopharyngeal nerve, vagus nerve, spinal accessory nerve that is a descending one and why? Because here the spinal accessory nerve was ascending, 
here the spinal axis nerve is descending okay internal jugular vein inferior petrosal sinus and sigmoid sinus these are the structures that are present within the jugular foramen so these are some of the very important things which you need to know in case of head and neck guys so thank you so much for uh, watching this video regarding the head and neck goodbye